Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the first awareness workshop on the Personal Data Protection Act 9 of 2022, uh, conducted by the Chamber Academy of Ceylon Chamber of Commerce in collaboration with META and ICTA. I would inform everyone of the house rule uh, on, on the onset of webinar. Kindly switch off your camera and mute your mics. Only the speakers will use their audio and video options for the presentation and dialogue. Questions from the participants will only be taken through the chat box. A recording of the session will be shared on the conclusion of the session. If may I give you an introduction of the today's session, since the enactment of the Personal Data Protection Act number no. nine of 2022, earlier this year, it has become vital to raise awareness on the provisions of the you're muted. Right here. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I think I'm audible. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first awareness workshop on the Personal Data Protection Act number nine of 2022, conducted by the Ceylon Chamber Academy of Ceylon Chamber of Commerce in collaboration with META and ICTA. I would inform everyone of the house rules. Kindly switch off your camera and mute your mics. Only the speakers will use their audio and video options for the presentation and dialogue. Questions from the participants will only be taken through the chat box. A recording of the session will be shared on the conclusion of the session. If I may give you an introduction of today's session, since the enactment of the Personal Data Protection Act number no. nine of the 2022 earlier this year, it has become vital to raise awareness on the provisions of the Personal Data Protection Act and its in impact on various industry sectors. For this purpose, the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce together with META and ICTA launch a series of awareness workshops aimed at different sectors who will be affected by the Personal Data Protection Act. So we are at the commencement of the uh, awareness uh, webinar series today. Without further ado, I may introduce the eminent panel of the today's session. Mr. Jan Fernando, General Counsel, ICTA, Chairperson, Data Protection Law Drafting Committee, Ms. Sandhani Vikram Singha, legal consultant and privacy, privacy professional, member of the Data Protection Law Drafting Committee. Ms. Shankar Jala, manager, regulatory dialogue at SETA PLC, data protection, member of the Data Protection Law Drafting Committee. Mr. Sujit Christie, president, ISC2, Colombo chapter, uh, and cybersecurity advisor and CISO. Dr. Anne Kavakian, Executive Director, Global Privacy and Security by Design Center. With that, I now uh, welcome Ms. Aliki Pereira, Deputy CEO, CEO uh, and the Secretary uh, Financial Controller of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you. Ms. Uh, I, may now, I may now invite Aliki to deliver this opening remarks. Yeah, good afternoon. I hope I can be heard. Yes. Okay. A warm welcome to our resource personnel and workshop participants to this first in a series of awareness workshops on the Personal Data Protection Act number no. nine of 2022, hosted by the Chamber Academy. The Chamber is indeed pleased to have a panel of eminent speakers and experts, both local and international. And we thank them for accepting our invitation and taking their time to be part of this workshop. The Chamber from the start of the drafting process for data protection has been a key stakeholder providing industry feedback where relevant to the ICTA team. Post the passing of this legislation earlier this year and in, the, and in discussion with Janta Fernando, who spearheaded this initiative from the start till its current point, we thought it was best to explain its implementation and implica implications from an industry perspective. 
This first workshop will be general in its scope and approach and will not be sector specific. Based on the outcome and feedback from this workshop, we intend to organize several other sessions at a sector level, and we are hoping some of these can be organized in person. Therefore, feedback and learnings from this session will help us design the future ones as well. We thank the ICTA for their support in this process and members of the drafting committee who have joined this workshop today. Without taking too much time, let me once again thank the resource personnel and wish all the success for the program. Thank you. You're on mute, Shehara. Thank you, Eliki. Sorry for, sorry again for the disturbance. Um, now I may welcome Mr. Chant Fernando, uh, General Counsel ICTA and the Chairperson Data Protection Law Drafting Committee to do the session one, introduction to the powers and the function of the data protection. Mr. Fernando, over to you. Good afternoon uh, uh, to all of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my colleagues from the drafting committee, Sanduni, Shehara, um, and all colleagues, uh, Shiran from Ceylon Chamber, Aliki, and um, Shehara. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the efforts taken by Ceylon Chamber to uh, organize a series of events starting from the session today. Uh, it has been a novel experience um, for us over the years since we started the process in 2019. And indeed, as observed by the earlier speaker, Ceylon Chamber played a pivotal role in giving us sectoral support, uh, giving guidance in the continuous uh, public consultation process that we had uh, in relation to the, uh, the various stages of drafting. Uh, from the time we started the process in 2019. Um, let me upload the slide. Uh, I'm in a remote location, so uh, please bear with me if I'm not, uh, uh, if, if there are occasional breaks in my presentation. Uh, in order to save bandwidth, I'll be uh, stopping the video and uploading my slides in a second. Um, can you, uh, Shahara, can you see the slides? Yes, I can see the slides. Thanks. Uh, you can see them moving, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon to all of you uh, uh, back in Colombo. Um, I hope to give you a snapshot overview of some of the salient features um, and the background. Uh, to the formulation of this important piece of legislation, uh, but more importantly, focus a little bit on the powers, functions of the regulatory entity and some of the checks and balances that have been introduced. Um, my uh, fellow members of the drafting committee, uh, Sanduni Vikramasinghe, as well as Shahara, uh, uh, as well as Shilpa Jayalat, have joined us this afternoon in this uh, first part of the session where we are giving an overview. Uh, I will let Saduni take care of certain uh, key um, features, especially those in part one and part two, uh, but I will give you a holistic overview before that, as well as uh, together with some aspects of the data protection authority, which is yet to be established and its significance in terms of ensuring uh, overall governance of uh, this important piece of legislation. So in terms of background, I think many of you who are engaged with us from the outset would be familiar with the fact that uh, this law was important from, a, from multiple angles, from the angle of uh, investment um, uh, promotion, from the angle of 
private sector development and creating new waves of opportunity uh, in the context of digital economy. Um, I will touch on that aspect when you look at the overall objectives of the Data Protection Authority, we will see how important this piece of legislation is uh, for the next phase of economic development and digitization in the country and the emphasis this has given to all the aspects of uh, 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 innovation, digitization and uh, transformation in general uh, and the way in which data should be protected in that kind of environment. Now, uh, in the uh, in context of the background, I think we should know, uh, be mindful of the fact that uh, there have been a number of international standards available for many years, starting from the OECD privacy guidelines that set the stage for a number of international uh, legal instruments on data protection um, to evolve. So if you look at the European Union Data Protection Directive, the uh, APAC privacy framework, if you look at the subsequent uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection of Europe, uh, this, this yeah, evolved over the years based on, based on standards set under the OECD privacy guidelines. Uh, uh, there have been other standards that have uh, come up over the years, uh, especially international conventions uh, that have a binding effect, such as the Council of Europe Data Protection Convention, Convention 108, that has been uh, uh, joined by, uh, this is an instrument which is not just a European-centric convention, but it has been acceded to by several non-European countries, including Mauritius, Senegal, Argentina, Uruguay, and other countries coming on board like South Korea and Japan, uh, discussing the possibility of entering uh, conventions like Convention 108. Uh, the lack of our data protection legal framework was a barrier for investment protection. Uh, I would call it a non-tariff barrier. Uh, for Sri Lankan companies, especially SMEs wanting to enter the European market to enhance their business potential uh, from Sri Lanka and vice versa to attract businesses from Europe uh, to look at Sri Lanka as a destination uh, further enhancement uh, in terms of business process outsourcing uh, and digital economic development. So it is in that context, this piece of legislation has been identified as an important piece of legislation from an economic development angle. In terms of the process followed, uh, I think many of you are already aware of the international standards that were looked at when this law was conceived and formulated and uh, put into drafting mode. Uh, uh, we looked at a number of provisions, including the, the ones I mentioned earlier that is there in under the second bullet item. Uh, but we also looked at existing legislation from a number of Commonwealth countries, as well as uh, those from outside the Commonwealth, uh, including, the, um, uh, including uh, countries like Korea, Japan, uh, as well as the Californian uh, privacy framework, which is built on the, uh, or maybe I would say going beyond the general data protection regulations of Europe. Uh, and then we also looked at the Indian uh, legislation. Uh, there was a re announcement today that the Indian parliament has rolled back their uh, bill uh, uh, to uh, reconsider it, the bill that was submitted to Indian parliament in 2019, they have rolled it back as per a Bloomberg uh, news item that was uh, shared with by my colleagues uh, on our WhatsApp group. Uh, more on that later. But you can see a number of pieces of legislation evolving. Uh, well, what is interesting is that Sri Lanka became perhaps the first country in South Asia to formally uh, fast track this piece of legislation and enact it. 
um, uh, and maybe the first in this part of the world. But what is even more noteworthy of the fact is, is the fact that uh, we also built it on the foundational principles contained in Article 14A of the Constitution. Uh, as you, some of you uh, from the legal sector may know, 14A originates, uh, was a key provision that was include, brought in under the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, giving a right to information. And there are safeguards built in under Article 14A uh, with regard to uh, safeguards relating to privacy that needs to be respected in the context of right to information being exercised as a fundamental right. And that safeguard uh, having to be implemented through other provisions of law. Uh, so this may be looked at in the context of uh, uh, for interpretation purposes uh, should should be looked at it uh, look, uh, looked at in the context of Article 14A of the Constitution. And uh, what is also noteworthy is the fact that uh, this law was drafted uh, not behind closed doors but through a completely a transparent process that was adopted uh, right through uh, from the outset. The drafting work, the mandate for the drafting committee came through uh, from the Ministry of Digital Infrastructure in February 2019. The first framework paper was published on the 10th of June 2019. Uh, uh, we have prepared a short uh, an overview paper that will be distributed amongst the participants of this session that can be used as background reading material. In that uh, note, the article uh, that was jointly done uh, with my colleague Sanduni, you will see a very specific uh, section that deals with the process that was followed including the dates of the first public-private dialogue that we had on the 27th of June, 2019. And right through then till the completion of the process, every version was available online, uh, including the versions uh, periodically reviewed and refined and updated by the Legal Draftsman's Department uh, together with the versions that were further uh, improved based on the constitutional audit done by the Attorney General's Department as well. Uh, so right through the beginning to the end, uh, when the uh, bill was formally approved to be published as a bill, we have ensured a transparent process. There were seven stakeholder consultations, sectoral reviews, uh, and over 30 written submissions uh, uh, provided by numerous stakeholders. Now, what is important to keep in mind is that this bill uh, broadly takes care of three fundamental aspects. Firstly, it provides for the regulation of processing of personal data. Uh, secondly, it identifies and strengthens the rights of data subjects that will be dealt with in greater detail uh, by my colleague. Uh, thirdly, it provides for the establishment of the Data Protection Authority, including the powers, functions, duties of that authority uh, in the context of implementing this law. Uh, in the preamble of the statute, you will see certain aspects of uh, digital transformation uh, related language coming out. Uh, most notably in the first preamble, you see the emphasis that this law has been brought in as a necessary policy measure to facilitate growth and innovation in the digital economy in Sri Lanka. And we also highlight that this law uh, is not to be taken in isolation. This has been done uh, uh, to improve interoperability amongst personal data protection frameworks and to strengthen cross-border cooperation amongst personal data protection enforcement authorities. So the idea is, ladies and gentlemen, that this law would not be sitting in isolation. 
this law is a collaborative tool that would enable uh, partnerships not only domestically but internationally that would lead to the data protection authority being mandated to uh, ensure cross border collaboration including with other data protection authority frameworks in other countries and uh, uh, ensure smooth cross border data flow arrangements uh, for the next wave of opportunity and growth uh, for the digital economy sector uh, the the law in section 1 spells out the period that would be available for this to be brought into effect the law has made it clear that the date of operation of this act will not take place before 18 months from the date this law was certified by the speaker on the 19th of march this year so which means somewhere around september next year is the earliest this law can be brought into effect and uh, there is a window of opportunity between 18 to 36 months that can be looked at as a possible time frame for the law to be brought into effect. What is even more noteworthy is the fact that the data protection authority should be in place uh, well in advance uh, before the law is brought into operation. And that has also been spelled out in the Data Protection Act. Now, let me highlight some important definitions which are essential uh, for the understanding of the Data Protection Act number 19, uh, 9 of 2022. Personal data has been defined to uh, identify um, information connecting data subjects uh, with reference to a number of identifiers, such as the name, identification number, financial data, location data, including online identifiers, as well as other characteristics that can link an individual. Uh, that is the broad scope of personal data. You can see it's quite wide. We also have a definition for special categories of personal data that would encompass uh, health data, genetic data, biometric data, uh, and other special categories that will be treated uh, in, in more specific detail uh, under more stringent terms with reference to a particular schedule in the act that my colleague will touch on later on. Uh, data subject has been defined to mean to identify uh, natural persons. Um, uh, basically, it, uh, it brings out the point that this law is all about uh, identified or identified natural persons, alive or deceased, to whom these, these personal data set characteristics would apply. Uh, basically, keep in mind, the law is all about protecting rights of data subjects, which are individual rights and not the rights of companies, which, are pro which, are, which have certain uh, protections and rights under the Companies Act, and maybe under the provisions of the CC Act and listing rules. Uh, you have other laws like the Intellectual Property Act protecting intellectual property. Uh, this law is all about protecting individual rights, uh, natural persons, alive or deceased, uh, and that should relate to personal data that I explained earlier. Controller processor definition uh, is very um, uh, clearly given to uh, mean uh, entities both public sector, public corporations, and non-governmental organizations, so private sector, government, non-governmental agencies, all uh, would be covered within the definition of a controller, pr provided that entity is an entity that determines the purposes and means of processing personal data. A processor means a natural legal person including uh, organization, government, or private sector entity, which processes data on behalf of the controller. So I'll give some examples. 
But before I give those examples, we should keep in mind that we have in this act a definition for processing that broadly covers any operation performed on personal data, including but not limited to collection, storage, preservation, alteration, retrieval, disclosure, transmission, making available, etc., including erasure. So you can see the concept of processing is broadly covering a range of activities which would take care of day-to-day -day functions that are carried out by a bank, a telco, a, a hospital, or any governmental authority, including a um, educational institution. So uh, what is important is that uh, those frameworks are clearly defined. But before I come to the application of the act, uh, in terms of the controller processor relationships, you will see a number of them. Uh, in the middle column, we have given some examples. Uh, let's say an organization, um, like a department, uh, we have given an example here. Uh, registration of persons department, the identity card office that collects all our data and processes them. That is an entity that decides the purpose and means of processing our data pursuant to the Registration of Persons Act, amended from time to time, pursuant to which we, uh, uh, after the processing, we get what we call an identity, national identity card. Now, in that context, the identity card department or the Registration of Persons department is a controller they may have hired entities to manage their databases as well as carry out their processing activities leading to the issuance of the ID card that those entities whom the DRP has hired would become a processor. Uh, you will have public corporations, uh, cloud service providers, a telco or a bank that gets all our information, including a supermarket chain uh, to which we might uh, provide information uh, to subscribe to a loyalty program in all those circumstances, those entities would be a deemed controller within the meaning of the Data Protection Act and certain duties, obligations, liabilities would uh, uh, accrue to those entities defined as a controller or processor based on their functions. Uh, within the meaning, uh, based on certain safeguards available under the data protection law. So in terms of the application of the act, it's quite broad. Uh, the law says that the act will apply to processing of personal data where the processing takes place wholly or partly in Sri Lanka. And then it goes on to explain uh, situations where processing of personal data is carried out by a control or processor who may be either based in Sri Lanka, incorporated in Sri Lanka, or offers good source services to data subjects in Sri Lanka, including offering of, uh, including, uh, offering of good source services with specific targeting, targeting of data subjects in Sri Lanka. Uh, in those circumstances, uh, even you can see uh, in this context, global service providers providing a service to citizens and other persons visiting our country would be uh, uh, deemed controllers uh, within the meaning of the Data Protection Act and would be required by law to ensure the proper uh, safeguards and the governance requirements under the Act. And then we have other another provision that talks about specifically monitoring the behavior of data subjects in Sri Lanka, including profiling. Now, the circumstances in which a specific targeting of a data subject can happen, the circumstances in which a specific monitoring of data subjects uh, can occur, will be defined by rules published by the Data Protection Authority. So you can see the importance of the Data Protection Authority from that point of view uh, in time to come. Uh, and all these aspects would mean that not only companies, government entities, NGOs in Sri Lanka, but those outside the country processing data of uh, individuals uh, operating from Sri Lanka 
would be uh, liable uh, under the provisions of the Data Protection Act number nine of 2022. The law has spelled out scenarios where the act would not apply. And those are very limited uh, to scenarios like uh, any personal data processed purely for personal, domestic, or household purposes by an individual. So you process data in the context of uh, hosting a party or your personal event. In those circumstances, uh, that data would not be protected under the uh, Data Protection Act, and situations like that have been excluded. Uh, in terms of the broad scope, uh, you will see uh, there are uh, 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 key principles of data processing um, found in part one of the Data Protection Act that defines the scope of lawfulness, uh, specific uh, purpose specification, purpose limitation, accuracy, confidentiality, and ensuring transparency as well as accountability. So for example, the scope and the parameters of, let's say, a privacy notice uh, and what should be included in a privacy notice with reference to Schedule 5 is spelled out in Section 11 and the most important self-governing framework coming out of the accountability matrix, which we refer to as a data protection management program, another unique feature in this act. All these provisions are found in part one. My colleagues, Sanduni, will be going into the details of that. Uh, same with part two that she will cover that defines the scope of individual rights, uh, which are known as right of data subjects. And then we have specific obligations on controllers and processors outlined in part three, uh, direct marketing, uh, dealing with unsolicited messaging uh, or sending leaflets, uh, pamphlets um, connected with direct marketing related activity covered under part four. Part four, please note, will be brought into operation at a much later date. The powers, duties, functions, and the staff, uh, and the scope of their duties uh, uh, in relation to the regulatory functions of the Data Protection Authority are in part five and six. Penalties and exemptions are in part seven. Uh, my colleague will touch on uh, some of these key provisions, namely part one, part two, part three, uh, in the next session. Uh, so I will not go into specifics of those, but limit uh, my next phase of this last few slides uh, to a few areas uh, which I have uh, picked, uh, which I thought would be important uh, from a corporate perspective. Um, and one of them is cross-border data flows. Uh, this, dealing, this is dealing with uh, uh, hosting information in cloud um, environment, right? Hosting personal data in uh, the cloud. So cloud hosting aspects are specifically covered under the Data Protection Act in section 26. Uh, I think I have maybe got only a, a, another few minutes, uh, so I will be quick on this last set of slides. Um, um, I hope I'm okay with the time. Uh, just send me a WhatsApp if I'm uh, going beyond. Uh, in terms of section 26, what is to be kept in mind is that public authorities have certain limitations with regard to hosting personal data in the cloud. However, unlike some of the other laws, the scope of public authorities have been narrowed down to ministries, departments, and statutory bodies performing uh, statutory functions pursuant to a law enacted by parliament. Uh, those entities would have certain localization uh, obligations However, we do not have strict localization in our Data Protection Act. There is flexibility for public authorities as well. Uh, most notably, uh, we have provided 
for public authorities like departments, ministries to data to, to, to do data classifications, categorizations, and based on necessary approvals from their supervisory authorities to post data in the cloud. And please note that these are some of the key regulatory supervisory functions that needs to be carried out by a future data protection authority. But in the absence of that, uh, we are not providing the functions of a data protection authority in the interim. We are only providing non-binding guidance to private sector, government, and other non-governmental stakeholders to ensure that they take meaningful steps to implement this act properly. And that we have done. We are trying to do that to the best of our ability through sessions like these. Uh, however, when it comes to organizations which are not public authorities, which are in the private sector, including government banks and government-owned companies, there is greater degree of flexibility for them to host information using cloud services with reference to specific provisions in section 26 and uh, flexibility provided under section 26 5 that was brought in through a committee stage amendment due to several concerns raised by private sector uh, about the limits imposed in the earlier versions of the bill uh, in relation to cloud hosting of data. So you can see the flexibility in uh, 26.5 ensures that it can be done uh, if the transfer is necessary for performance of a contract um, and with explicit consent of a data subject and um, uh, by necessity in the public interest, broad opportunities and options are available for the private sector to host personal data in cloud environments. Well, lastly, on the data protection authority, I just want to highlight a few aspects, most notably the powers, functions uh, of the authority. Uh, there is a three-tier selection criteria for the board of the DPA, which I will not go into details now, but the objectives of the authority pressures out the point I was trying to make earlier that this law is in a way connected to digitization because if you look at the overall objectives in section 31, it is not only the, uh, the regulatory authorities, not only there to regulate processing of personal data, that entity is required to safeguard privacy of data subjects from adverse impact arising from digitization both in the public and private sector. All these are found in section 31. And then it is uh, the regulatory authorities also they are to provide for mechanisms to ensure protection of personal data of data subjects engaged in digital transactions uh, and communications and ensure regulatory compliance with the provisions of this act. So these are the broad regulatory remits of the data protection authority uh, spelled out in part five of the data protection authority. But uh, I just want to highlight that uh, if you look at section 32 and 33, you will see that it has broad powers uh, to give directions uh, for compliance to controllers and processors, uh, carry out investigations, receive complaints, require persons to appear and uh, give testimony under oath, uh, visit organizations, uh, uh, and go to their premises and take records to carry out investigations, uh, as well as to do awareness sessions, engage with uh, uh, international regulatory agencies on data protection to ensure that our law is harmonized with the rest of the world, uh, recognize certific certification and certifying bodies that will conduct awareness programs and so on and so forth. So large, it's a large remit that has been given to the Data Protection Authority. Uh, we hope that the, uh, that the government at, uh, will take cognizance of the necessity to establish the Data Protection Authority sooner than later, so that when the law is brought into effect, they are able to give regulatory guidance uh, uh, 
uh, two controllers and processors to ensure meaningful implementation of this act. Uh, another important feature of this act is to provide uh, where the regulatory authority can formulate rules uh, regarding a number of functions, including uh, uh, those related to uh, carrying out uh, data protection impact assessments, right? So many folks in recent times in the context of the FUA lab and many other uh, activities that are ongoing, both in government and private sector are looking out uh, for regulatory guidance uh, uh, on uh, measures that should be taken uh, by controllers and processors uh, under, let's say, Section 24, where uh, there are uh, guidelines and provisions for rulemaking and in, uh, regarding circumstances where a DPIA or data protection impact assessment should be carried out. So these aspects have to be dealt with um, at a later stage, uh, especially if you look at section 23 and 24, uh, these are important measures that should be carried out in the future by a, a, a regulatory authority to be established. But most importantly, uh, this act also has got the uh, provides for the uh, uh, ability for the regulator to uh, issue licenses in the context of un, uh, the identity management and related services. That's also another unique function. But the most important uh, feature of this act is also the fact that the director general and the staff uh, are required to be selected on a transparent competitive selection criteria based on rules that will be published by the authority. Uh, as well as uh, certain uh, other criteria uh, that have been uh, established in part six. So for example, the staff uh, have to go through periodic training and there is provision uh, for uh, the scope of uh, a range of activities that the authority um, should cover broadly. If you look at section 37, subsection two, you can see that the regulator is required to promote and sponsor training of technical person on the subjects of information security, data science, data analytics, information technology, finance, law, and a series of other sets of uh, characteristics that would be necessary for a, proper, a properly structured regulator to function uh, for the proper implementation of this act. Uh, the, the law also provides for the staff of the regulator to be placed with international uh, uh, organizations as well as international data protection regulatory authorities in other countries so that our staff would be able to better understanding, get, get a good understanding of the uh, parameters of regulating uh, important law such as the Data Protection Act in line with international standards. Uh, another important feature of this act is a provision where the regulator has to establish committees for the formulation of sectoral guidelines, rules, and to identify criteria for those. So you will see, for example, under the Data Protection Management Program under Section 12, guidelines can be formulated by the regulator. For that, sectoral committees uh, will have to be established, let's say for the banking sector, insurance sector, uh, for the telco sector, for the health sector, maybe for the tourism sector, there can be separate guidelines issued to ensure self-governance uh, to uh, comply with the minimum standards under the Act. Another important feature is that the rules published by the authority has to be published for public consultations that's another novel feature in this act, uh, which you do not find in other regulatory uh, legislation in this country. Uh, it is only after public consultations that the rules can be published in the Gazette. Last of all, uh, the Data Protection Authority has got the power to issue directives. Now, remember uh, many 
I have seen many people highlighting the fact that this law brings in penalties, which is a maximum of 10 million rupees, no doubt, but that does not mean the regulator will go on a voyage of uh, introducing, you know, imposing penalties of 10 million all the time. It can be 1,000 rupees, 10,000, depending on the uh, grievance and the violation and the steps taken by the control or processor to re remedy them. But before the regulator imposes a penalty, there's a requirement under this act, under section 35, for the regulator to conduct investigations, inquiries, and have a hearing, and thereafter impose directives. Directives are measures which are administrative, light touch, I would call it a soft law measure, through which the regulator can give regulatory guidance to an entity to do, to do course corrections, to comply with the law. If there is a contravention after the directive has been given, only the uh, uh, Data Protection Authority would embark on uh, imposing administrative penalties. But remember, in doing a penalty, uh, certain measures, uh, mitigatory measures under Section 39 will have to be considered. The nature of the grievance, the steps taken by the control or processor to uh, uh, remedy the contravention, the effectiveness of the data protection management program under Section 12, uh, and other aggravating or mitigating factors that has to be looked at, and so on and so forth. Last of all, this law contains certain important features and the most important safeguard in this act is found in section 40. Uh, it's a legal subject. I will not go into this in detail because there's not enough time. I'm already overstepped by about a few minutes. What is important to realize is that the ex exemptions, restrictions, derogation section in section 40 is built on the uh, principles of international human rights law that would necessarily require the regulator to have checks and balances, uh, which leads me to a concluding point that all of these administrative uh, actions taken by the regulator is subject to appeals to the Court of Appeal and in, in a Court of Appeal review process, uh, we have Supreme Court uh, determinations where uh, in the context of the provisions of section 40, a number of uh, other safeguards will be looked at by courts and other supervisory authorities in implementing this act to ensure a safer, uh, a hygienic ecosystem under which uh, we can implement this uh, data protection act. So with that note, um, I will conclude by uh, uh, my presentation for now. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I overstepped by about four or five minutes. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, and I hand it over to our colleagues at Ceylon Chamber. Thank you. Uh, Shahara, over to you. Uh, thank you, Janta. Uh, for the next uh, session, thank you for uh, doing the great uh, introduction on the powers and function of the data protection. For the second session, I may invite Ms. Sandini Vikram Singh, her legal consultant and privacy professional, uh, member of Data Protection Law Drafting Committee to do the session on uh, obligations of controllers and processors and rights of data subjects. Uh, Sandhani, over to you. Uh, thanks, Shahara. Uh, good evening, everyone. So hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. So in the interest of time, I'll uh, quickly take you through uh, uh, 
the obligations and rights uh, that are uh, contained in the Personal Data Protection Act. And thank you, Janet, for uh, taking us through the uh, powers and functions of uh, the authority, which is going to be set up in the future. So when you look at the obligations of controllers and processors, uh, so generally the act spells out um, obligations specific to the controllers as well as obligations specific to the processor. And there are certain other obligations which are common to both controllers and processors, which we will look at briefly uh, in the coming uh, minutes. So when you look at the obligations specific to controllers, the, the, the first starting point is the principles of processing, which you find under part one of the act. And uh, the, it contains eight uh, basic principles. And each of them requires the controller to, uh, to, to structure its processing activity in accordance with what is uh, set out in these principles. So when you look at the lawful principles, which you find in section five, section five which is the first principle, um, it gives out the lawful basis on which you can process personal data as well as special categories of personal data. As Jan, uh, draw the distinction a little while ago. So if you are a controller who process personal data that does not amount to special categories, of course, then you will find uh, the grounds in Schedule 1. So the important factor to note here is that sometimes there's this misconception that the consent is the only, a consent of the data subject is the only ground a controller can process personal data, which is not the case. And the Act is very clear on that, and it gives several grounds or several lawful basis uh, wherein uh, a controller can base their processing activities. So it could be uh, a consent, and if not, it could be uh, you're performing a contract with the data subject concerned, or you need that data to perform a legal obligation, which you as a controller is subject. So similar, uh, 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 actually not similar, but additional grounds are given in Schedule 2, especially if you are a controller who is processing special categories of data. So special categories are essentially data that is considered to have a higher level of sensitivity. And uh, you would see when you compare the two that Schedule 2 contains a bit of a more strict or stringent uh, um, requirements. So whilst there is consent, uh, again, there are additional uh, conditions on that. Uh, there are, you won't find things like contractual obligation um, uh, or legitimate interest of the control given in Schedule 2. So if you are processing special categories of data, then if it's not consent, maybe you could find your basis either under things like employment law, social security, uh, establishment of legal claims, uh, or pursuing a public interest insofar as it's prescribed by law. So it's important that when you have a purpose or you have a requirement in your business um, to process personal data, to look at how it would match against the schedule, the first schedule if it's uh, non-special categories and schedule two if it's special categories of data and see how you could um, find basis uh, to satisfy the lawfulness condition under section five. And when you talk a little bit more about consent, the Schedule 3 of the Act provides certain conditions which a control needs to satisfy in order to establish that it has ob uh, obtained consent within the framework or within the, uh, uh, within the framework of the Act. So consent is defined to mean something that is freely given, specific and informed. And it's important that a controller demonstrates in a way that the data subject has given consent. So this is where you can't really rely on tacit consent where you, um, I mean, you would have often seen there's a general practice, you include all the um, terms relating to personal data processing in the general terms and conditions. And you kind, I mean, sometimes the customer doesn't see it, sometimes it does, but then there is no separate consent and you just put a line at the end saying, you know, by uh, signing here, you agree to the terms and conditions um, when it comes to processing your personal data. But this, uh, such practices may have to be revisited once that comes into play because the controller must demonstrate that there was uh, uh, there was affirmative action or, uh, given by the uh, data subject that he has uh, specifically given an informed consent. And if you're going to uh, uh, combine 
the conditions for consent with other methods in a declaration. So it, it's important that you clearly distinguish these elements of consent and it must be in a way that is easily accessible or intangible um, and in a plain and clear language, uh, which can be understood by the data subject so that you can establish this consent was informed and the, the data subject understood uh, the purposes and risks involved in processing activities. And moving on to the other uh, principles, the second one is about purpose specification. So this is where it requires a controller to uh, process personal data for a specified explicit and legitimate purpose. And once that purpose is determined, so of course this, this has a cross-reference to section five as well, especially when you're determining whether uh, uh, a purpose is legitimate or not, then once the purpose is defined, you must ensure as a controller that the processing activity is adequate, relevant and proportionate uh, to that uh, purpose you have identified. So just to give you a little flavor or like an illustration of uh, what it all means. So I have a very basic example where a controller runs an online grocery store and it collects the following, the date, the name, the address, the phone number and NIC. So, um, the as you can see, if you take this, uh, the, the, the row of phone number, so it says it's specified in the privacy notice. So it, uh, the notice would say to send notifications regarding the order we are collecting your phone number. So it is a specified um, purpose, it is explicit, and of course it's legitimate because of course the customer needs to be kept informed of the processing activities. And as long as you keep it just for sending uh, notifications regarding the order, of course, it can be deemed as adequate, relevant, and proportionate. On the other hand, if you take it, uh, if you take a look at sharing information with third parties for promotional messages, assuming this was never uh, put in in the privacy notice, uh, is that purpose specified? No, so it fails that specified, explicit, and legitimate uh, uh, test, and thereby, there, there, since there is no purpose indicated it kind of uh, ultimately fails the purpose limitation conditions as well. So it's important that uh, these two principles are taken together when you are um, designing your uh, data protection management program, which we will uh, take a look at a little later. And when it comes to accuracy, of course, accuracy, uh, it seems simple because it just requires the controller to make sure that the data that you process, personal data that you process, is accurate and kept up to date. And this also kind of ties up to the rights of data subjects uh, who has a right to rectification, uh, which is guaranteed in the Act. So by your own volition or if, if, if a data subject uh, make a request that certain data should be updated or rectified, then uh, of course, uh, you need to comply with that and making sure that when you enter data into your databases there's always uh, that there's there's only a very little room or no room at all for errors to data entry errors to occur and when it comes to storage limitations so storage limitation is where one of those very contentious um, uh, discussions take place because it's about how long you need to keep data uh, under the app so it's about uh, the, what the act requires from controller is to you, that you need to keep it insofar as it is necessary to perform the purpose you have identified. And if you're going to keep it for any longer period, of course, there are exceptions such as uh, archiving the public interest or scientific research and so on. Uh, you need to have a legal basis to retain it for any other purpose um, uh, for, for, for reasons uh, that requires you to keep it for longer periods. And Confidentiality principle, uh, which we find in section 10, is uh, speaks about ensuring integrity and confidentiality of the personal data. And it requires a, the uh, controller to use appropriate technical measures and organizational measures to make sure uh, that uh, the, date, the personal data that is in it custody is safeguarded from unauthorized or unlawful processing or loss or destruction or damage. Uh, so offers. And I think in, uh, in our, one of our next uh, sessions, this aspect of uh, uh, data protection principle would be looked at in great detail. And coming to the principle of transparency, 
so transparency is about informing their subject via the controller about the basically about the processing activities. So you need to notify a data subject uh, at the time you collect information from him. And if not, uh, if you collect it from other sources, that also has to be notified. And, and these the, the, these notices has to be easily accessible. And uh, it should be uh, if any changes take place to the practices, also must be notified uh, to the data subject in due course. So there are certain exemptions to this uh, uh, requirement as well. So especially if uh, the data subject is already aware of the information, or uh, it requires, uh, you know, if, if individual notification involves a disproportionate effort, then of course you can make it publicly accessible and so on. And the final principle is about accountability. So this is why it speaks about having the internal uh, oversight mechanism uh, system to make sure that the, the organization complies with its um, data protection obligations. So, it, on top of requiring the uh, controller to maintain records on how it uh, operationalizes its data protection principles, um, it must also be designed according to structure, the scale, the volume, and sensitivity of the organization. Because organizations vary in terms of their the volume of data and the sensitivity of the data they process. So, uh, what may fit uh, uh, the 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 right management program that may fit a bank may not be suitable for a say for a hospital chain so you need to look at how to uh, customize um, your privacy uh, or data protection management program according to the sensitivity and volume uh, of the processing activities so essentially a data protection management program must be uh, a skater to providing safeguards based on data protection impact assessments, which a controller must carry out. And it must be integrated with the governance structure of the controller. So it kind of, I mean, I generally treat section 12 as something that binds the rest of the act together and gives uh, the key to the controller as to where to start its uh, compliance uh, framework or compliance journey um, on the act. So in the interest of time, I'll skip to uh, the additional uh, control specific obligations. So one is breach notification. So the uh, act does not specify when uh, the authority or the data subject should be notified because uh, I think in other jurisdiction, you have a window of 72 hours of coming into, uh, you know, getting to know about the breach. But uh, in this case, it's a, uh, best, it's, it's a authority vested with the data protection authority to determine by way of rules uh, uh, as to the time in which uh, 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 breach should be notified with authority as well as to data subjects. So we'll have to wait until the authority is set up to get a more clear idea on this. And data protection impact assessment is also a control specific obligation. A controller must uh, is mandated to do a data protection impact assessment especially if it engages in systematic extensive evaluation of personal data or special categories of personal data, or it engages in profiling and or it uh, systematically monitors publicly accessible areas. So the purpose here is to ascertain the impact of the intended processing um, on the rights of the data subjects. So you would uh, generally, that uh, DPIA process involves looking at uh, the, the data that is collected the data flows and trying to identify uh, risks and vulnerabilities and uh, recommend ways to mitigate those risks and uh, contain any vulnerabilities. So a DPIA must essentially be performed every time you change technologies or change processes and so on. And another uh, control specific obligation is uh, related to sending of uh, unsolicited messages. So this is, again, this would uh, come into operation only uh, after 48 months of the act coming into uh, effect. Um, so of course, there'll be enough grace period for controllers to get their affairs in order when it comes to unsolicited messages. So basically what it requires is uh, controllers can uh, no longer send unsolicited messages. You must always obtain consent uh, 
before you transmit any uh, electronic or device message. This includes postal communication as well. And one of the most important conditions where a controller must consider, uh, especially uh, when appointing processes, because in, in, in uh, current context, a controller cannot undertake to perform all the processing activities by itself. So it's natural to outsource certain activities to third parties. So in, in, in such a context, a uh, controller must ensure that it uses processes who can ensure appropriate technical and organizational measures. Uh, who can give effect to the act because end of the day you are also you're you're answerable to the authority or your data subjects about the acts of your choice of the processor so it's important that you perform necessary due diligence of processes before you uh, take them on board and you must also use processes who ensure the protection of the rights of data subjects under this act so again a certain level of due diligence is required on the part of the controller and make sure that the uh, processes are bound by contracts or the written laws, which sets out the subject matter, the duration, the nature and purposes of processing it. So looking at the obligation, before moving to rights, I think I'll just take a brief look at obligations specific to processes, because uh, processes by law, I mean, this is one of the areas that um, face a lot of changes during the committee stage amendment phase. And you would see that a lot of uh, certain level of flexibility has been afforded to processors uh, with the amendments. So a processor is obligated to comply with the written instructions of the controller. So it could be in the form of a contract uh, or any other written instructions. So the moment a processor would deviate from these instructions would, uh, would make such processor deemed controller within the uh, provisions of this act. And a processor must also ensure that its personnel are bound by um, contracts, uh, uh, contractual obligations for confidentiality and secrecy obligations. And it must also facilitate the controller to conduct compliance audits and inspections upon its request. And of course, er uh, erase or return the data uh, once the services have ended. And if the, a processor is engaging any sub processes, of course, the, the, the main processor remains answerable uh, or liable to the activities of the subprocessor to the country. So a lot to be considered if you are um, acting in the capacity of a processor within the meaning of the act. So when it comes to obligations common to controllers and processors, I think Jayanta covered about cross-border obligations, uh, the directives and penalties issued by the authority. So in addition to that, uh, there's this requirement to appoint what we call a data protection officer. And there are certain uh, situations where there needs to, uh, a BPO must be mandatorily appointed, especially if you are a public authority, uh, a government ministry or department, or if you are a controller who is process or uh, process personal data in a manner that systematically monitors data subjects uh, according to a prescribed scale and magnitude. So we'll have to wait and see until the authority is set up and rules are um, prescribed accordingly to uh, really get a clear idea about uh, which uh, the, the categories of uh, uh, controllers would fall uh, or processes would fall within that uh, uh, definition. And the act also provides for some certain qualifications for the DPO. And the responsibilities basically involve advising the controller or its processors about the requirements under the act and uh, assist the controller to uh, from, you know, meet its compliance objectives and so on. So it will be a uh, DPO is essentially, uh, it's, it's a role which in certain jurisdictions, uh, some or like some organization they outsource, um, but it should be someone who is in a position who can, uh, who has, uh, a direct who is part of the top management and uh, in a position to make independent decision decisions and review uh, the activities of uh, other uh, divisions or departments as well. And finally, when it comes to the rights of data subjects, so there are several rights uh, the Act recognizes: the right to access. So this is where a right is given to data subject to request uh, from a controller uh, as to what data uh, the controller keeps about such data subjects. So 
these rights are exclusively to be ex uh, ex exercised by data subjects against the controller. And if uh, uh, and a data subject also has the right to withdraw consent, especially, uh, I mean, only if the processing is based on consent. And a data subject can also write to object if the, the basis of processing uh, of their personal data is legitimate interest or public interest. And like I said, mentioned earlier, there is a right to rectification. Uh, if the data is inaccurate or incomplete, a data subject can make a legitimate request to have that data corrected. And finally, um, the right to erasure, where the data subject, if it's in the opinion uh, that the processing activity is in, done in contravention of the act or he has withdrawn his consent at a previous stage, he can make a request uh, for the data, to, uh, the data stored with the uh, controller to be erased. Of course, uh, and then finally, uh, section 18 speaks about automated individual decision making. Again, uh, it's, a, it's only a request to have a, a decision taken solely on automated means to be reviewed by the controller. However, there are certain exclusions to this uh, section 18, uh, if it's authorized by law, or if it's authorized by the data protection authority or the subject has given explicit consent or it's necessary to perform a contract. And it's important to know that the previous uh, five uh, rights are subject to uh, uh, certain exemptions. Uh, so the controller can refuse to act on a request of a data subject on the uh, grounds that you uh, see here, like national security, public order, the technical operational feasibility of the controller, uh, if rights and freedoms of others are at stake and so on. And it's also been noted that the rights can be exercised by not just by the data subject, especially if it's uh, uh, relating to a child, it could be through, it could be by the parents or legal guardian. Um, and it could be a person authorized in writing by the data subject uh, and also an heir of a deceased data subject within 10 years of uh, the data subject's demise. So these are the um, obligations specific to controllers, processors. And, uh, and if you have any questions, please put it up on the chat and we will take it up in the next session. Thank you. Over to you, Shahar. Thank you, uh, Sandini, for the informative uh, presentation. And with that, uh, we'll be moving to the next uh, third session of today's workshop. Um, I again, I wanted to. Uh, this is the Q the Q and A session for the. Uh, the presentations we can we have completed so far. So I would like to invite Mr. Jan Fernando and uh, Ms. Shanika Jala, uh, Manager Regulatory Dialogue Access of PLC and the member of Data Protection Law Drafting Committee. And session will be moderated by Ms. Sandani Vikram Singh. Uh, Sandani, I uh, well, I invite you to take over the session with the uh, two panel members. Um, thanks, Shahara. Um, yeah, I think there were a couple of questions um, on the chat as well. And uh, is Shanika? I don't see. Shanika and uh, Jantha is on call. Okay. Right, um, so I uh, would like to ask Shanoka this question because you, you, since she's part of the organi of an organization which is uh, along its uh, compliance journey, um, because, uh, and we couldn't really cover it entirely in, in my description of the accountability principle. So, uh, Shanuka, in your experience, like what are the major changes um, faced by a controller when setting up uh, the data protection management program under Section 12? And what would be your advice to overcome them? I think that would be something 
um, our audience would be like really like to hear from you. Uh, so thanks, Sandhani. Thanks for that question. I think uh, at this point, it's an excellent question to ask what are the major challenges you'd face when setting up your data protection management program? Because currently, uh, most organizations would be wondering what on earth this data protection management program that Section 12 envisages is. So I think one of the key challenges that you have would be to know, okay, do I need, how do I go about setting in place this program? And in the course of doing that, you would uh, you'd be in a position, you'd have a challenge basically identifying your maturity level in terms of privacy, whether your organization has zero processors or whether you have some processors in place, but they're not documented or whether you have access control. So all this uh, would be important to assess your maturity level in terms of privacy. So I think one of the key challenges an organization may face is I just figuring out where are we at this point in terms of privacy, What where do we stand? So one way you could overcome that is by assessing how assessing your data life cycle. So basically you will have this sheer volume, the sheer volume of data, not knowing where data is, the channels through which you collect data, the data flows, who has access. So if you do a full assessment of your data from its from the time it enters your organization to the time you purge it and everything in between, you will be able to assess where you are at this very point. Um, another challenge that face at this point, I think is the absence of the requisite knowledge and skill. Uh, your, your, the, the internal team plays a key role in this. Privacy is a team sport. So, it's not something uh, a legal department or a compliance department can do in isolation. It needs the buy-in of your IT, IT, your other compliance teams, your security teams, so your business teams. So the, it's an organization-wide journey, as it were. So you really need to uh, you need to get in the right team, and you need to get in the right knowledge. So either you need to upskill the existing staff, you need to train them or you need to hire externally, but during this the current economic crisis, I mean, hiring externally might be a challenge for most organizations. So maybe you could think of getting help from external consultants who can guide you through what you need to do, because um, it's important that you get it right. Uh, the, the act is not yet operational, but once the data protection authority comes into place and it becomes operational, the possibility of a fine is very real. So, so you need to have, a, and you need to go on this journey where you set in place your program and you, you your journey to compliance. So getting the right team in place, the skill is it's essential because if you, if you went through the previous two presentations, you'd see uh, the act is rather technical. So it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but you need to have someone who can help you along with it. Um, the other uh, challenge I think would be if you are a company which outsources your data processing activities to third parties. So they would become your processors. So alongside uh, ensuring compliance on your part, you would also need to ensure that your data processors also maintain the required standards. So your vendor agreements, your you need to you need to really look at those things. You need to include data protection clauses. If there is processing of personal data, you need to train your external vendors and maybe even you need to audit them occasionally just to make sure that they are uh, in line with your standards. Uh, another key challenge would be the CEO buy-in from most organizations because um, data protection in Sri Lanka is relatively a new concept. Uh, we've had it imposed by statute license to a very slight degree. It's not a new, it's not a brand new concept, but uh, the extent which the act proposes is brand new to us. So most CEOs might not even, and senior management might not really see the value of it. They'll be like, so, so what, what, what do we do? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an act that has come in. Okay. And they might not see the massive amount of work that you need to do to ensure compliance. So a CEO buy-in, I think, is, is crucial to for, for the success of any data protection management program. Um, additionally, I'd say info, information security practices. Uh, it's impossible for privacy to function without adequate security measures. So your security practices, if you need to update, you will need to look relook at them to make sure that your personal data that you process is secure. 
that's that's a key challenge which might entail you having to do a full study on that um additionally you need to uh, address breach management if there is a data breach what do you do you have to have plans in place uh, and it's not just a plan that you write on a piece of paper and you just forget about it it's it's a plan that's a live plan that you need to keep testing you need to do simulation exercises so your staff is aware that if a breach occurs this is what i need to do um, another key thing would be to ensure that the products and services that you uh, basically that you're you're developing at this very moment in a, in the next couple of months there is a chance that those would also come under the scrutiny of a data protection authority so if you incorporate uh, concepts of privacy and security into your products and services right now you will be compliant when the act comes into uh, into play so privacy by design that's i think we're looking at this in depth later today but it essentially means that you integrate privacy and security considerations into your product designs into the architecture of your products so that's that's another key thing i think uh, you could do to which would enable you to face the challenges and it would also strengthen your data protection management program later on uh, when an authority comes into play thanks shanika that was very um it's a very comprehensive answer i think um, it's important that the audience also take cognizance of the fact that it's not an easy um journey to uh, begin with so it's important that they start this uh, process early and i have a question i think i'd like to direct it to jantha about i think uh, uh, it's about whether there are any pr uh, penal provisions for non compliance or failure to comply under this act um i think uh, sabir as uh, i may have explained that in my presentation the bit of a rush at the very tail end um in terms of uh, penal sanctions i think it is very clear that unlike uh, regulatory frameworks enacted by many asian countries that have strived to uh, bring in criminal penalties uh the data protection act number 9 of 2022 uh brings in both a soft uh, soft law measure uh introduced through section 35 which we call directives uh, which are administrative in nature uh, uh done consequent to a formal inquiry investigation uh carried out uh with regard to maybe a potential non compliance by a control or processor in those circumstances this soft law measure which we actually borrowed from the payment and settlement systems act which has survived and stood the uh, test of time um would entail that uh the the regulator uh, intervenes in a manner to bring the non compliant party back on track uh and that directive uh issuing measure under section 35 can also be subject to challenge in the court of appeal by way of writ if the rules of natural justice for example have not been complied with it is only thereafter for a violation of a directive and consequent to that violation that uh, a potential violating party would be subject to uh, penalties uh, under section 38 but we should keep in mind that penalties are administrative fines these are not penal sanctions although in the event of a non payment of a penalty the recovery of the penalty has to uh, go through what we call uh, a recovery procedure under the um, uh, under section 37 uh, through the magistrates court but we have to keep in mind 
uh, that uh, under section 38 of the, uh, uh, of, of the Data Protection Act, uh, there is a provision to recover the penalty through the magistrate's court. But we should keep in mind that in introducing uh, penalty, the regulatory authority has to keep in mind a series of factors, including mitigating circumstances under section 39, including but not limited to steps such as the effectiveness of a data protection management program. So I think uh, I need to emphasize or maybe overemphasize the points you all made about you, Sanduni and Shenuka, about the need to have a self governance, uh, self regulatory measure in house through your data protection management program. Effectiveness of that will be measured from time to time by the regulator once the data protection authority is established. But the regulator has to look at uh, aggravating and mitigating circumstances, as in, including the effectiveness of, data, of a data protection management program uh, and the nature, gravity, and the duration of the contravention, as well as the action taken by the control or processor to mitigate the damage suffered by a data subject who is impacted by the violation, the degree of cooperation the control or processor had with the regulator, including uh, notifying the regulator about the contravention before the data subject goes and complains. So those aspects under Section 39 are very unique in the sense that uh, those have to be uh, taken into account before a penalty under Section 38 uh, is imposed, keeping note of also the fact that the penalty can only kick in uh, consequent to steps taken beforehand under Section 35, namely a directive through which the course corrections guidance can be given to a violating party. And these soft law measures accompanied by the penalties would make a law different to others which have criminal sanctions. Thank you. Um, Jean, uh, as an extension to that, there was a question raised about, uh, like, in comparison to the GDPR, which provides uh, in Article 82.3 that uh, controllers or processors can be exempted from liability if it proves that it is in no way responsible uh, for the event uh, giving rise to a damage. And there is no or like identical provision in the data protection net. So in such context, how would you uh, respond to that question about uh, what is the, what the liability of a controller would be in the context of a data breach? Uh, because uh, you know, there is no, uh, no identical um, provision in the PDPA. Yeah, so I think uh, what is interesting is that when you do a comparative exercise between one piece of legislation with another standard, even if we have borrowed certain fundamental principles from another standards, it may be difficult to always look at comparable legal provisions because they have to keep in mind uh, in GDPR, has features, uh, is a domain which has uh, common law, civil law mixed uh, and a large common law partner left that economic community through the Brexit. Uh, we have to keep all that in mind. Uh, so one may not be able to find identical language because in our law, as those who were involved in this journey in the multiple public consultation process would uh, realize uh, there, were, uh, there was language or certain principles from GDPR that was certainly uh, and to a great extent customized and uh, adopted in terms of processing principles, rights of data subjects, 
and uh, cross border data flows to uh, and including the uh, obligations on controllers processes but when you look at those um, uh, measures that you just quoted we should keep in mind that uh, there are other factors that needs to be looked at so for example i just need to highlight again in section 39 the mitigating circumstances may be not necessarily exemptions from liability, but we should keep in mind mitigating circumstances that a regulator would look at in the case of uh, damages or liability that can occur due to a breach. If the breach has been reported upfront to the regulator, it is very clearly spelled out in section 39 somewhere in those paragraphs in section 39 if you look at the fine print you will see uh, other aggravating or mitigating factors applicable to the circumstances of a case um, such as loss avoided directly or indirectly um, and uh, situations where uh, the contravention became known to the authority was it reported by the data subject or was it reported by the control or processor, right? Those aspects would certainly contribute to perhaps not exemptions from liability, but mitigations that will closely resemble possible exemptions. I mean, I can't second guess exactly how a future regulator would interpret section 39, but I would think a sensible regulator would look at those mitigate circumstances to perhaps exempt a genuine uh, a bona fide controller processor who has taken all necessary steps including the effective data protection management program action to uh, mitigate the damage uh, under section 39 and cooperated with the regulator and reported the damage or the loss beforehand before the data subject and and if you look at it in that broader context we would see uh, or similar scenarios can be actually implemented if the regulator has the requisite uh, staff is well equipped and is professionally trained to uh, uh, to exercise their regulator to remit effective thanks Jan. um i i don't we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I'd like to direct this to Shanuka uh, to implement uh, this, I suppose, to implement the act, how does data classification uh, would be helpful as a first step? Um, thanks, Samini. So I think data classification is important, uh, no doubt. It will help you identify exactly what sorts of data you have. Um, but as a first step, I think, uh, it's, it's more important to know your entire process, the flow. So once you identify the flows and you identify where this data is, where the, the data is coming from, where it resides, thereafter, I think you can move on to data classification. Thanks, Jennifer. And um, I think there was uh, another question I'd like to uh, take up both Jant and you uh, on this. Uh, it refers to the exemptions under Section 17.2 for the right to erasure. I think the question means how can a controller refuse this on the grounds of exercising legal claims or evidentiary purpose for a company? I suppose in a, uh, a company who would like to maintain certain evidence uh, relating to certain activities, how, how can they refuse a data subject's request for erasure? Um, so if I could just give you industry examples, let's take a ba the banking sector or even the telco sector. Uh, we, we collect personal data under authority of statutes or regulations issued by the respective regulators. Um, there are certain circumstances where this data is requested for by law enforcement agencies. Let's say if you're a bank, you will be asked by FIU uh, financial intelligence unit or even telcos sometimes CID comes and they might ask you for certain customer information for the for law enforcement purposes 
So in those circumstances, if you have, if you're in the process of providing those details or, uh, or in the or law enforcement might actually ask you to keep your records for, a, for X amount of years, that that might be a requirement. So if you have to retain it by law, uh, then you cannot delete it even if, uh, even, even if a data subject uh, would want you to do that because you're required by law and your regulator to retain that data. Um, uh, if I'm to add, if I'm to add to that, uh, uh, Sabina, I, I think uh, I think the question was, which limb uh, in seventeen two that such steps may be carried out. Um, so I think it is very clear. Uh, seventeen two broadly spells out circumstances where a controller may refuse to act on a request made by a data subject having regard to national security public order, any inquiry conducted, an investigation or procedure carried out under any written law. So as pointed out by Shenuka, uh, for the purpose of, of the question, I just want to emphasize that 17.2c uh, and uh, maybe something one can look at. Uh, and then there are other provisions in the subsequent paragraphs, including um, paragraph H that might be relevant. There are, for example, under the Financial Transactions Reporting Act, there are uh, requirements for uh, information to be maintained. And then if you look at the Right to Information Act, there are minimum periods specified under the Right to Information Act for information defined within the meaning of the RTI Act to be retained for a particular period of time. Now, that law overrides many, many other laws. And as a result, may require necessarily a public authority, especially uh, to prevent erasure. But if it is a private sector or a bank, or entity which is regulated through other laws, one has to look at regulatory guidance from uh, those regulatory entities uh, and connected legislation like the FTR and other laws that will necessarily provide you uh, guidance and even procedures that are required to be uh, done under those written law uh, would be covered under 17 two paragraph C and maybe other paragraphs like H. Thank you. Thanks, Janka. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions because um, the government informed me we need to stop for a short break. Um, so I think the uh, panelists would uh, join me in responding to some of the questions raised on the chat, or on the chat itself. Um, so over to you, Shahara. Uh, thank you, Sandini. Uh, thank you, Janta, and thank you, Shenuka, for uh, taking the questions and uh, giving uh, us a good uh, informative uh, uh, explanation. Uh, so now we, ha we have uh, a, a break for 10 minutes. So we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes. Uh, with the rest of the presentation. We have uh, next in line, Mr. Sujit uh, Christie uh, to conduct the session on information security standards and practices in the context of achieving compliance under the uh, Personal Data Protection Act. And uh, from that, we'll take to the session seven and eight uh, accordingly. Okay, 
Hi everyone, we are back in uh, with the workshop on uh, a workshop on the Personal Data Protection Act number nine of 20, 2022. With the, the, after the break, we have uh, the next session on information security standards and practices in the context of achieving compliance under the uh, Personal Data Protection Act. And session deliver uh, the, the speak. We would like to invite the speaker for to deliver the session, Mr. Sujit Christie, President ISC uh, Colombo Chapter, Director of Layer Seven Seguro Consul Consultoria Private Limited, Cybersecurity Advisor and CISO. Uh, hi, Sujit. Over to you. The session. Hi, Shiara. Good evening. Good evening. Are you able to see my screen? I just yes. uh, want to do a quick uh, check. Are you able to hear me as well? Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. It's better if you go for the presentation mode. Yeah. Just a moment. I'm just uh, trying to get into the slide. Are we okay? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening to talk about how to secure your personally identifiable information in the context of the Data Protection Act 9 of 2022. At the outset, I would like to uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce, the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber Academy, and of course, uh, Sandhani, Jayantha, and the team for inviting me to present how to secure your information. So to set the context, I'd like to talk about the breach timeline. Now, if you take Sri Lanka as a country, I mean, uh, we, we don't hear much of uh, breaches unless otherwise you hear it through friends or in an informal way. And even if it does make it to the media, it's, it's uh, very few in numbers. But if you look at this uh, slide, uh, which I have taken from the data breach investigation report of uh, 2018, this actually shows the timelines of a breach. And what you actually see here is only 3% are discovered as quickly, that is, in a few minutes from the time the breach has occurred. And two thirds went undiscovered for months or more. Now, you may ask, has this situation changed? The situation has not changed. Let's look at the IBM's cost of data breach report 2022. I'm, used, I'm going to use this slide to set the context for the rest of my presentation. So on, on your left, you can see the initial attack vectors, right? And you heard Jayantha Sandhani and uh, the fellow speakers also talking about the incident response plan and about talking about the scenarios, testing, and all those things. So you may also use these initial attack vectors as scenarios for your incident response plan. So what you will actually see here is the mean time to identify. So you may also ask, what does this data mean? This data is collected from 17 countries across the world covering all the continents. So Sri Lanka is not listed in this report. But the closest neighbor, India, is part of this report. And Asia PAC, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and then of course, zero, the North America, the South America, all of them are included in this. Now, when you look at the timelines, right, it, it, that means it has taken over 200 days, or in some cases, a little over 140 days 
for people to detect that there has been an incident. And then you also notice that the, once you detect that there's been a breach, the time taken to mitigate it or the contain the breach. So when you look at the complete life cycle, we are talking about over 277 days on an average, right? So that's a lot of days, right? That's almost uh, nine months in a year, if you may take it, that you know that people probably had the chance to detect and also uh, respond to a breach. So when you look at this particular slide, here also you can see whether from this number of people who were surveyed, the number of companies which have been surveyed, you can see how many of them had an incident response plan and how many of them regularly tested them. And so testing, regular testing is also important. And more importantly, you also need to identify your risk or the breach scenarios and also understand what it would have as an impact on the organization. The last three items on the list, I mean, there, there are several incident scenarios, but I'd like to highlight these three as well, because your supply chain, today organizations are dependent on a global supply chain for different purposes. It could be for procurement or for even for delivery of services. So your partners with who you trade or you have a business relationship, some of them may even directly connect to your network, or some of them may indirectly connect to your network in the form of an email. So you can actually see the amount of supply chain attacks which have actually happened. And one of the other areas we are talking from a people perspective is the, the qualified teams or the, the security teams, whether they are sufficiently staffed, whether they have the right skills, right expertise, that is also listed here. And we are also seeing in the last two to three years that people are also adopting a zero trust security architecture. So, so what you what you are also seeing here is some of them have adopted, and some of them have not adopted. And one of the important things you need to remember when you're looking at these numbers, we are exclusively looking at those companies which have been breached. So we do not talk about people who are not being breached. Here are companies which have been identified as had. Uh, companies which have had a breach, and that's what these numbers are all about. So when you have a breach, it, it triggers a, a variety of actions. Now, now, what you see here in this slide, not an exhaustive list, but a list of actions which has triggered in these organizations, right? Now, one of them, if you look at uh, the slide here, it says, uh, you, you appointment of a CISO, right? Or appointment of a data protection officer. Right? So, so there are different roles which you need to create in your organizations. Then, then we are also talking about various other protection technologies. So, so when you look at a holistic picture, a simple breach can trigger several actions. Some of them could be people related, some of them could be technology related, some of them can be process related. So what do we do? Right now today we, we have a law which has been enacted which is going to come into force very soon. Do we wait till then to start our journey or do we start today? My advice to you is start today because it's going to take time it's, take, it's going to take time for you to set up processes, procedures, get the right people into your organization structure. Then of course, you need to also invest in the right protection technologies. So how do we do that? Right? So, so when we look at the data protection, I, I look at it in two, two parts. One is the privacy aspect. The other one is the security aspect. So what we heard 
earlier today is that more in terms of what the act saves in terms of the privacy. But what I'd like to talk about is in terms of what should we be doing to protect our information. So one of the first things we, we should be doing is to identify the right information. Do we know what is the information we collect? Where is it stored? Who has access to it? Right? And uh, you, you heard Sandini and Jayanta also talk about collect information to the extent you require. Now, we are, we are actually jumping into a running train. I may call it that way, right? So, so you may have been collecting information in the past. Today, you are at a juncture where you need to assess what have you been collecting, who has been collecting it, where is it being stored, who has access to it, and how is it being you know, accessed by various people, who is accountable for all these things. So all these assessment has to be taken care of, or you need to start delving into that. And the other thing which you also need to start looking at is the flow of information. How does the information flow into the organization? And how does the information flow out of the organization? So what are the touch points? What are the touch points in your network? What are the touch points beyond your network? Does the data actually reside in a place or it just you know, travels from point A to point B? So we need to understand if it is going to reside in a particular device or a, or a server, how are we protecting it? Or if it is going to be communicated from point A to point B or from person A to person B, is that information going to be sent secure? The third one, which we also need to ask ourselves is more importantly, the permissions. Right? Who has ac ac uh, access to view that information? Who has access to edit that information? Or in some cases, who has access to even backup or even delete that information? So you need to come up with a framework to manage your information from the data collection to data destruction. So I call it the data lifecycle management. So you need to have a policy. You need to have a framework which involves people, process, and technology. And then you also need to identify the right tools based on the sensitivity information to classify that information so that you can classify the information based on certain parameters so that you can actually filter if the data is leaking knowingly or unknowingly. Right, so, so when we start talking about information, you can protect the information by encrypting it, or you can also restrict the information by restricting it, restricting it by access or permission you grant to that information. So in order to make all these things work, you need to have a governance structure, right? So, so you cannot create a new governance structure. You need to review your existing organization structure and start introducing the new rules so that it actually fits into your DNA. So it fits into your current operations model. If you, if you have a senior management meeting, you need to have an agenda item which talks about data protection, data privacy. You also need to start looking at in terms of who will be held accountable, who will be you know, custodian of the data. So that governance framework is very, very important for you to establish. And that will be your starting point. So that would include your policies and procedures. And then you will go down and do your gap assessment. Identify the gap based on risk. So a risk-based approach is the ideal way to look at it so that you can prioritize, you can categorize them and treat them with the right uh, treatment methodologies. Last but not the least, you also need to educate all your users who, who, who come into contact with personally identifiable information. 
right? So you may have an information which, which actually travels from department to department to complete the complete transaction, but everyone in the organization should be educated and made aware as to how to handle that information. And more importantly, when, when they actually are talking to external parties, how to conduct themselves. Right. So in order to set up the governance framework or a security management framework, there are standards available, right? And predominantly most of the, most of you probably on this call may, may be aware of ISO standards, right? So there is an ISO standard, which is 27001, which primarily talks about information security. But the ISO standards have also have come up with a standard to protect the privacy of the information, right? So, so they have a privacy information management system, which is 27701. So that's a standard you can also start looking at it, right? So, so if you already have embarked on a journey for ISO 9000, and if you have already looked at certifying yourself with 27001, you can also look at 27701, and you can actually do a combination of all these. So there are different principles. There are about eight principles we are talking about, but I've just jumped directly into principles which actually specific to data protection and security. Okay. So when you look at data protection principle, the important one for me is the last line, keeping safe from unauthorized access and disruption. So how do you create your access rules? or your RACI charts, in other words, your roles, responsibilities, who do you consult, who do you inform, while, while executing your regular day-to-day -day work, and more importantly, if you detect an incident, how do you manage that life cycle? So that also has to be looked at. Then in terms of the accountability principle, you need to look at the audit traits, right? That is one important aspect. Who has access to it? When did they access? Uh, why did they access? And then also, you need to have a mechanism to trigger anomalies. If let's say you see suspected behaviors or suspect you suspect intrusions, probably it could be pointing to a data breach, right? So, so I also want to talk about a little more on the breach. When we talk about a breach. Somebody having unauthorized access to information can be treated as a breach. But a data breach, if the data is stolen and retrieved and you know exfiltrated out of the, the organization, then it is actually very, very serious. So that's what we need to be conscious of. So we should be able to determine what this breach is. Is it somebody just accessed and read the data or have they exfiltrated the data, right? So, so when you look at the leaks, you, you can also look at it from an external leak or an internal leak. So the data can be leaking to a person who is not authorized to have access to that information. And you also need to create scenarios. What are the different types of scenarios which can actually be treated as a breach scenario or even as an abuse scenario. Because certain things on a regular basis, people may treat it as a regular activity, but are we in a position to determine or preempt and say, hey, in these conditions, this should be considered as a breach. And breach notification is very, very important right? in this whole life cycle because it, it talks about two things, right? As soon as possible and without undue delay. So when you, when you do the investigation, you have a challenge first to determine, has there been a breach? If yes, what is the extent of the breach? So you should be able to determine these two as quickly as possible. So in order for you to do that, you need to understand or document the data flow. You need to be able to set the baseline process so that you can understand or easily identify anomalies and then determine that there is a breach. And more importantly, you should be able to contain that breach as quickly as possible. So 
The other one which we need to talk about is the access control principle. You would be hearing me talking about this repeatedly, but then there are there are other things which we need to look at, right? In terms of the quality of the data, the accuracy, the completeness. Right? So, so typically we are talking about the integrity of the data. And then the other aspect we need to look at is, okay, is the data available when you need it? How do you ensure availability of the data when the data is required by the person who is requested for that information? So all that aspect has to be taken in the context of access control principle. And the last one is the security safeguard principle. So the, the base principle you need to look at is collect information, what is bare minimum, be clear as to where the information will be stored and how long you'll be storing it. So that, that clarity you need to have and that should form part of your data lifecycle management framework. Use encryption technologies wherever possible with the right keys so that you know the information is protected. So if the information is in your database, encrypt your database, right? If your in, in information is being sent from one location to the other over the internet, then encrypt your whole communication link. So, so you need to understand when the data is rest, rest, how would you protect it? When the data is in motion, how would you protect it? When the data is in use, how would you protect it? You also need to assess in terms of the redundancy requirement. Because today, that is also a cause for concern. So people may be you know, backing up information in multiple locations, and you need to know where exactly the data is residing. So that discovering part and then applying the right technology protection also becomes very, very important. And last but not the least, you also need to start looking at your physical security aspect, because if the data is residing in a particular physical location, you need to you need to be sure that you know only authorized people have access into that premises, and then of course you also need to start looking at other forms of threats if it is targeting your network, the logical threats, the cyber threats. Do you have a mechanism to trigger any anomalies? So you know, in my earlier slide, you I I did mention that some of the breached organizations had embarked on a zero trust architecture. Now, this is a relatively a new concept for a lot of organizations, but in my mind, it's a very simple, easy to adopt architecture, which all organizations can consider, right? So when you look at your identity, you're basically looking at who are your users? Are you able to identify who they are? Are you able to determine the level of access you're going to grant? Are you in a position to track and see what activities they have performed? And more importantly, how do you authenticate these users? Now, traditionally, people use username and a password. But when, when a password is compromised or stolen or lost, very, very rarely the, the, the person who has lost it would know that they have lost the authentication credentials. So today, people are adopting multi-factor authentications. It's another form of authentication in addition to the password. So you continuously validate, authenticate the identity. So which means even if somebody has gained access to the password, they still will require the second form factor to authenticate themselves to gain access to the networks or even to access the information or the databases. So that's a very important part, right? So, so you can look at the identity as a single pillar and then look at what you need to do to secure the identity. The, the important identity, there are two types of identity I would actually worry about. One is the regular user. The other one is the administrator, the person who administers the infrastructure. Between these two, the administrator would have a wider access capability. He would have more privileges. 
So if his or her identity is compromised or his password is stolen, which means the attacker would have would be able to gain access to the whole infrastructure, the whole information, and which means it would actually put the organization at a greater risk. So it is important that all identities start using the second form factor, which could be an app-based authentication, it could be an SMS-based authentication, whichever is convenient, get started, right? So that would actually prevent unauthorized access. The second pillar which you need to focus on is the device. The device which is used to access the information or connect and retrieve the information through the application to the database or the application, the devices have to be secure. So are the patches updated on a regular basis, operating system patches, security patches? Are the devices secured with a good Antivirus, today we are talking about EDR, XDRs. So, so are we looking at all, all forms of hardening of your endpoints? That's your device, right? It could even be looking at the reputation of your DNS. So these aspects together, right? The, the identity and uh, the device together is required to connect to a network and information. So while, while you focus on the identity and the device, on the other hand, you also need to start looking at protecting your information. So identify the information, identify where it is located and look at classifying, labeling and classifying that information. That is one step you need to do in terms of protecting the information. The second step is in terms of look at the access rights, which identity, which device can connect and retrieve that information or which device and identity can connect to an application and connect to a database. So before they connect to the network, there should be some form, right? So when we talk about a network, it can be a physical network, in your office, or it could be a cloud infrastructure. So before these devices and the identities connect, identity has to be authenticated. Every time they connect, they need to get authenticated, and the device also should get authenticated. And then do a sanity check, right? a health check, to see whether the device meets your organization's pre-required or pre-predefined security controls. Your device has to be clean, not infected, not jailbroken. Because if it is infected or if it doesn't have the latest antivirus signatures, then there is a potential that device can could have been compromised. Now it connects to the network and the attacker could have access to your information and your infrastructure without any restrictions. Right? So these are simple uh, techniques which, which you all can adopt day one, even start today. I mean, start asking yourself, how are you identifying your users? Are you authenticating them continuously, all the time? Right? It is not like you authenticate once and then you leave them eternally. Right? So they need to get authenticated every time they try to access the information. It may look a little inconvenient, but it provides you that added assurance that you would not have to worry about a serious breach. Right? So look at your identity, look at hardening your devices, secure network, look at protecting your network using a good firewall, intrusion detection systems, and various other controls which you need to protect your environment, your information, your applications, and your database based on the risk profiling you have done. Right? This is just an indicative uh, table which I have put down for you. It's not conclusive, but just to give you an idea. Right? So you can take a five-step approach. Now here too, in your previous slide also, I'm talking about five things. I'm talking about identity device, network information, and application and databases together. Right? And here you're looking at five pillars, right? Identify, protect, 
and detect. So every asset you identify, could, it could be an identity, a user, it could be an information, it could be a device, you identify and then you ask yourself, what is that I need to do to protect that asset, the user, the information, the device, the network? Then once you put in your preventive control, also ask, okay, what is, how do I know that my control which I've implemented works as intended? Is there a mechanism to trigger an alert for me to know when it is working well and also when it is not working well as expected? So you should have a mechanism to detect. In other words, unless you define a baseline, you would not be able to identify the deviation or the anomaly. Once you identify an alert, a deviation, an abnormal behavior, now for example, let's say uh, a user A had attempted to access a database, which technically he should not be accessing. So he had attempted. Are we in a position to detect that? That you know, somebody is even trying to attempt, even though they have not been given the privileges. And once you detect, you should actually trigger your response plan. You need to investigate. You need to identify if, whether there is a breach. If there is a breach, you need to quantify. You need to notify. You need to communicate to the relevant authorities, internally and externally. And then, once you've done all this very quickly, you should be able to recover and come back to your original position. Learn from the past, learn from the mistakes, fix all the weaknesses so that you can remediate them very quickly. So in order for you to remediate and recover, you need to be doing your scenario-based incident drills. If it is a ransomware attack, what would you do? Who will you notify? Who are the people who will get involved? What are the action you would take? How would you deal with the media? How do you deal with the law enforcement? How do you deal with the regulator? Right? All that has to be documented, practiced. Everybody should be aware. People should not be reacting at the last minute when an incident occurs, not knowing what to do. And that's the worst situation to be in. So as much as possible, try and define your baseline, document your processes, test it, practice, repeat it again, identify weakness, correct it, remediate, improve your plans, and keep testing it all the time. So it is important that you, know, that you have a top-down visibility and a bottom-up visibility. When I say top-down, people down to the networks and hardware, and likewise, you should be able to see everything what happens in your network from bottom to the top as well. So all your organizations, you, you, have, you probably have these three levels of defenses or three levels of checks. And the first line of defense, the second line of defense, and the third line of defense. Incorporate your data protection requirement into these defense mechanisms, right? Look at the management controls. Look at the internal controls, right? Review it, get it audited. Look at the risk, look at compliance, right? get the people trained, the internal auditors. If you don't have an internal audit team, get subject matter experts to do that part for you. Get the external auditors. And then if you are a regulated organization, then the regulator, when they come in, you are actually up there meeting the regulatory requirements. Right? So, so you look at the complete organization's governance structure, the people, process, technology, and also look at the, the three lines of defenses as well, right? So that's about it from me, Sunny, if you're there. Uh, I, I'd be happy to take any questions, Shara. Uh, yes, Sujit, uh, we have two questions. Right. Um, Sujit, thank you for a very comprehensive uh, um, presentation and 
uh, and you've taken us through the whole journey of you know how information security practices can actually help organizations to meet um, you know the obligations under the act and there was a question put on the chat uh, directly special to you from Sanji uh, it's asking about how does IOC I think it was just doing incidents of um, compromise and incidents of attack artifacts will help uh, in an attack vector and the second part of it is and how does you map metro attack framework in the data protection life cycle good question sanjay thank you for that question and uh, it's been a while since we connected as well so mitre framework has actually evolved a lot and it's one of the best frameworks which i would actually re recommend for incident management because they, they talk about the ttps the techniques the tools and the procedures so when, when you look at a scenario if you recall the earlier presentation, the slide which I was talking about, the attack scenarios. So you can look at those scenarios and map it to a threat actor. And then start looking at, okay, are you able to see any of those symptoms in your network? Right. So, so MITRE attack framework is a good framework if you can in, build it into your network architecture. And today, most of the modern uh, security control tools come inbuilt with the framework. If you if you are looking at upgrading, see whether you can actually invest in a framework which can actually address the uh, requirement. Or uh, in other words, uh, use this framework to address your security requirements. Sanuli? Thanks, Sujit. Um, there's another question from Jani, and she's requesting whether you can um, briefly explain the three lines of authority in the last slide. Okay. Will you explain? Now, let me go back to the slide then. All right. So the first line of defense is identified. Now, for, if I were to take an example, right? Let's say you, you have uh, a set of PII identified uh, information residing in a particular database or accessed in a difficult, specific application. So when you look at your management controls, you're looking at your policies. So what are your policies? Your data privacy policies, your access control policies, and various other security policies would come into play. The, the second set is the internal controls. So what are your internal controls? So how do you protect your information which is residing in the database using preventive controls? And then of course the detective controls. So preventive controls can be to straight away, you know, prevent a uh, attacker, you know, compromising your information or you know, uh, uh, causing destruction to your information. So you may look at encrypting your database, right? So that's a preventive control. You may also look at access control. That is also a preventive control. Then you're looking at a detective control. Are you in a position to look at your audit rate, your audit logs? So you generate your audit alerts, you review them. The second line of defense here, I would actually focus on cybersecurity, risk management, and then of course compliance. So each of them are a different pillar, right? So all of them have a role to play. So when, when the risk management team gets involved, you're actually assessing the risk in the context of that information, which needs to be protected, right? To be compliant to the regulator's requirement as well. The cybersecurity team would actually look at how do you protect that information? by implementing technical controls and technical preventive controls and technical detective controls as well. The compliance team would actually start looking at what are those requirements which needs to be in place to ensure compliance to the legal requirement or the regulator's requirement. So when you have the, the compliance team with respect to data protection, the cybersecurity team working hand in hand with the compliance team and the data protection team, identifying the risk and mitigating those risks using the right appropriate controls. 
the second line of defense comes into play. The third line of defense is to give assurance to the management that the controls implemented are working well and are adequate. So that's the role of the internal auditors. Right? They continuously assess the effectiveness of the control and give assurance to the management. The external auditors would also use the work of the internal auditors and probably expand a little bit or if they have a specific scope defined, then they would work on it and also assess again, whether your management controls and your internal controls are working as intended. So I hope that clarifies your question. Uh, thanks, Sujit, I think that was very explanatory. Um, I think we have time for just one more, and this is a question that actually one of my own questions, uh, because generally um, companies, I mean, data protection is not new to most companies. Some are already uh, conversant in their information security practices. So would you say that compliance with uh, standards such as ISO 27001 uh, or uh, 27701 guarantee uh, compliance under the PDPA, or is there something more controllers are expected to do in order to right? So, so I would say I would want to you know use a different word instead of guarantee. Right? I I don't think we can have guarantee that you know there will no there be no breach, mm -hmm. but what it would help a framework such as a standard like twenty seven thousand one or twenty seven seven zero one would help put in place a, a framework which is suitable, more suited for your organization. So you can customize it to fit into your environment, to meet your regulatory requirement. So the standard also specifies certain do's for you and certain don'ts. So that is also an aid for you so that you can adopt it and which is easier for you to implement. So you are actually guided through a structured process like a plan, do, check, act, it helps you to assess continuously and improve your processes. So what does it mean to a regulator or to a third party? When you adopt a standard, it defines, it indicates to them that you have a structured process to manage your data protection, right? It is not ad hoc, right? So you have a systematic process that in itself will give a lot of assurance to the people who are going to work with the organization that the organization is adhering to the best practices. So because when you adopt a standard such as 27001 or 27701, it is also audited by an external entity or the certification body. So when they audit and review your processes, they would also give a certificate at the end of the day saying that, you know, these are areas where you're doing well, these are areas, there's potential scope for improvement. And in the process, that also indicates to a customer of yours who is engaged with you that, you know, that you, you have reliable processes which can be dependent upon. Because it also talks about the, the preventive controls, the detective controls, and the remediation process, including incident management and the responses or the business continuity plan. So, so the whole gamut of things are covered in a very structured, straightforward manner. Sanu? Thanks, Sajip. I think that clears, clears the air uh, to a great extent. And unfortunately, that's all the time I'm told we have um, uh, for, for your session, actually, there are more questions coming in, and I would really like to uh, invite Sujit to, uh, if you don't mind, uh, responding yeah. to the questions on chat. Sure, uh, I will do that. The next session. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sujit, for sharing uh, valuable insights on importance of information security standards and practices. Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Sandini. Uh, Vikram Sinha to do the uh, session on managing workplace privacy under the uh, Personal Data Protection Act. Sanduni, over to you. Um, thanks, Shahara. And uh, in the next 20 minutes, I'll briefly take you through uh, about how the Personal Data Protection Act um, uh, interacts with workplace privacy. So this will basically look at how employers, even though they may not uh, process customer information per se, 
uh, there is still certain level of uh, obligation casted on them as controllers uh, because they uh, process employee data. How uh, you can um, manage the uh, compliance uh, expectations under the Act. So uh, this is a, a notion that uh, workplace nowadays have turned into this uh, place of surveillance because uh, even from even not just from in the recent past, but even even uh, history of uh, workplace, you know. There's a tendency for employers to monitor their employees to ensure efficiency and so on. So this is just an image um, um, captured from uh, 18th century philosopher Jerry Bentham's uh, Panopticon. So this is a structure where they just put one observatory tower uh, for a uh, prison that is de de designed as a half a circle. So the idea is that uh, when you give a sense of uh, being observed all the time to the inmates uh, or any work for that matter, even if you really take out uh, the observer uh, without uh, the, the uh, inmates knowing, the people would still behave themselves. So this kind of the theory that has worked into uh, present day work, uh, workplaces as well, because employers tend to uh, go on the um, idea that the more you monitor your employees, the more efficient things would be and, you know, the more control you would have. So this kind of, you know, as we move into the digital working space, uh, where, you know, with, with remote working, with the gig economy and so on, it's, it's the, the, the devices we use to perform our everyday functions uh, end up watching us uh, every behavior or every aspect um, of our work life. So it is in that context, I'd like to, for us to look at uh, how workplace, uh, the, the, the blurring of lines between personal sphere and uh, workplace sphere in, in, in the present day. So you have in one side, you have your personal communications, personal relationships, behaviors, likes and dislikes, and then you have you know, what you do in your official capacities, um, in your work time, official communications, use of corporate properties and so on. And then there are, there's a middle uh, position where things blur a lot, uh, where you can't really distinguish what is personal and what is workplace. So when you allow people to bring their own devices or work from home or work from anywhere, uh, things like uh, the recent things like COVID tracing, uh, you know, back to screen and so on. So we will look at uh, some of these uh, issues and see how the Data Protection Act uh, applies in certain uh, situations of this nature. So first year we look at how the personal data protection principles uh, applies in the employment context. So when you look at, uh, as an employer, you would be uh, required to collect personal data uh, as well as shared categories of data from your employees as well as prospective employees. So it could be because uh, you need the data uh, to, go, to perform a contract, especially if it's non special categories of data. So you have a contract of employment where you know the employee is supposed to perform certain services and in turn you are uh, paying a remuneration to do all those obligations to each uh, to meet each other obligations in the contract. It would be required for you to process certain uh, personal data of the employee. It could also be that there is a legal obligation for you, uh, such as requirements and employment laws to request certain data from your employees, such as, you know, we have this practice of obtaining fingerprints or EPF or ETF um, related uh, matters and uh, uh, paying, you know, uh, employee taxes and payment of taxes and so on. And another ground where, which you can, which can legitimize your uh, processing of personal, uh, of personal data of employees is any legitimate interest that you might pursue. So a legitimate interest is defined in the act itself. So some of them include things like prevention of fraud, um, ensuring information on network security. Um, and uh, so it's, it, there could be certain in incidents where you want to protect the, the data of your customers or your proprietary uh, matters from breach or from being leaked outside. So there could be certain legitimate interest uh, that you may pursue that could be uh, defined under Schedule 1 of the Act. 
So uh, the reason why I put a question mark next to consent is because consent is a tricky concept to uh, go by because of the the as you would have remembered in the earlier presentation, I uh, explained that consent has to be freely given, explicit and informed. And in in uh, other jurisdictions, especially in the European context, it's, uh, because this has been tested there. Uh, one of the issues with relying on consent is because they've often found that there is no um, similar uh, position, or there is no the consent cannot be deemed to be freely given in the con in the context of employment. So, if you, it's not that you cannot rely on consent. There could be limited in, uh, circumstances uh, which would allow you to rely on consent, but consent should not be treated as the only ground uh, to uh, legitimize processing personal data of employees in an environment. And when it comes to special categories of personal data, of course, uh, the Federal Tool recognizes that if you want to carry out obligations as a controller, and uh, or to the exercise of rights and subjects of the data uh, of the data subject, uh, um, such as recruitment, performance in employment, health and safety, things like that, such matters uh, can legitimize your processing of special categories of data. So that this includes asking for certain health screening for certain of, uh, you know to, prior to being recruited to certain roles doing background checks, you know, like in banks, I think you ask for uh, you know, uh, history or record or like a Ramaseva certificate, things like that. And certain that would, uh, you know, certain information that it's important for the role that you're recruiting for. And it could also be for purposes provided for in law, such as employment laws, like I said earlier, collective fingerprints, that's a biometric, calls under special categories of data, if it's provided for by law. And um, you may also process in certain conditions, data manifestly made public by the data subject. So this is where controllers, uh, who are, I mean, employers who would look at the social media profiles or um, a certain uh, information that it was made public by the data subject. So uh, the, the situation there is a bit um, tricky because um, you can't really draw a line between monitoring the private sphere of the employee as well as what's related to your uh, the job function or the job role. And again, consent is uh, contentious because the, since the employer and the employee is not position, you know, are not an equal level, uh, consent can be uh, questioned by, uh, is questionable uh, because you, would not be in a position to establish that the consent was freely given because withholding consent would mean uh, losing the job or not being hired at all. So, so in terms of purpose specification, so it's important that whatever purpose you want em employees to disclose certain personal data, that those purposes are specified, explicit and legitimate. And if uh, I think one of the best places you can achieve this is having a workplace monitoring policy so that you can set out the kind of data that is collected, the forms of monitoring that take place. So whether it's uh, whether you're um, analyzing electronic communications, you know, to what extent that communication takes place. I mean, are you going to read the content? Um, and if it's physical monitoring, what to what extent that physical monitoring takes place and so on. And if a legitimate interest is pursued, what are those interests and if there are, if you are providing safeguards, what are the safeguards employees are given to protect their privacy? So, this kind of binds with uh, the idea that uh, of employees being given a certain uh, reasonable expectation of privacy. So, the more they know about the the, the workplace monitoring mechanisms, they would know to um, uh, regularize their behavior or their use of company properties. So it's important to refrain from processing for secondary on specified purposes, such as you know, using systems that were installed uh, to uh, protect customer or proprietary data, and you use it secondary to monitor the behavior or the performance of employees.
And when it comes to purpose confinement, it's important that uh, the processing remains adequate, necessary, and proportionate to the purposes you have identified. So this, again, becomes a bit contentious because when you're monitoring email and network communications. So there was this interesting case, um, I think uh, the audience would have shared with you, that was uh, held by the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Justice on uh, of a case in Romania where, a, where an employee's uh, personal email communication was monitored and the contents of it was reviewed. And it was held that it was a direct violation of one's privacy. So um, the question was that the, though the employee was informed not to use the company devices for uh, personal uses, and uh, the, the, the argument of the court was that the, the employee was not uh, specifically informed the extent of that monitoring activity. So it's important that whatever measure you take, it should be necessary, uh, adequate, and proportional. So proportionality plays a huge function especially in the context of uh, workplace privacy. And this also takes up in situation when you when employers allow employees to bring their own devices to work. So sometimes devices are not just used exclusively for work purposes. Uh, so employer may end up monitoring the, the communications or locations or behavior of the employee, even outside of working hours, uh, like on weekends or locations at at a given time. So it's important that you really look at uh, what are the safeguards or limitations you would place to uh, minimize the collection, the amount of data that you collect in situations like that. And uh, same goes for location tracking, uh, biometrics. Um, so, and importance of having how these uh, kind of intrusive mechanisms can have an impact on uh, situations where an employee wishes to raise a complaint anonymously or like in whistleblower uh, policies, how to um, harmonize uh, these, the, the legitimate interest of an employer to make sure that it's, it's, it's proprietary uh, data remains safe while ensuring uh, the privacy of the employees also intact. So uh, in, when it comes to accuracy, of course, it's uh, up to the employer to make sure the data is accurate and up to date. So this is where if the data subject request uh, changes to certain uh, you know, types of information pertaining to his employment, those should be given effect to just the way um, uh, you would act upon um, a data subject's rights. And in terms of retention, um, so data should be retained only for uh, such period that is necessary to achieve the purposes you have identified. So in scenarios like job applicants, so we, I, uh, I've often seen that whenever you, when in Sri Lanka, when you apply for a job, generally HR tends to keep these applications for a longer period of time. And even though some of those applications uh, have not been successful in securing a position uh, for the job advertised, the general um, justification here is that you know there could be um, you know roles that come up later on which might fit this person's profile. So it's important that when you accept applications, that the applicants are informed that you know that the applications are going to be stored for this period of amount of time. And if, I mean, even if the, the, the application is unsuccessful. So the same goes for ex-employees. So generally how long you're gonna keep uh, data relating to ex-employees is a question, especially if those data is not subject to an ongoing investigation or inquiry uh, of, of the employer. And social media screening, again, like I mentioned, so it's, it's, it's very uh, difficult to draw that line uh, because uh, unless, uh, you know, the, the employee or the applicant is informed, you know, the employee would be looking at their social media profiles, uh, you know, to gain an understanding of how much they fit for a particular role. And coming to the question uh, of the element of integrity and confidentiality, it's important as a uh, employer or as a controller that you maintain um, so security of the personal data by uh, deploying suitable technical and organizational measures. And you need to 
provide adequate security for special categories of data, especially if you're processing biometrics such as, you know, uh, fingerprints, faxes, uh, you know, managing access or things like that. And we must also make sure that uh, the employee data is not accessible to everyone within the organization. So this includes uh, data generated from monitoring uh, mechanisms. And if you are disclosing third parties, it's important that you follow, especially for government uh, agencies or any other third party. Uh, one, you need to uh, uh, make sure it for the disclosures are lawful, and if so, follow the necessary uh, protocols to make sure the data in transit is secure. And transparency is one of the most important aspects uh, when it comes to employer uh, employee privacy related uh, discussions. So how you can achieve this is by, you know, having a, a comprehensive workplace monitoring policy, which states uh, in, in explicit uh, terms, uh, not, not just for the current employees, but for prospective uh, employees who are about, before they sign in the contract of employment, what are the kind of monitoring that take place? And about the data retention policy, so how long you're going to keep the data of um, employees, uh, prospective employees, as well as ex-employees, and what exactly your BBIOD, uh, bring your own device policy, is for the organization. So uh, or whether you're going to install certain um, applications and what is the limit of monitoring of those applications are. And it's important as a, as a best practice to have engagement of your employees um, and consult them when you're formulating these policies. And it's important that these policies are off periodically reviewed um, and evaluated. And also the employees have provided adequate training and awareness about the kind of data processing that uh, you as a, a control undertake in the workplace context. And finally, when it comes to accountability, uh, it's uh, just as you would devise one for your customers, it's important that you have one uh, that is aimed at a work, uh, you know, looking at workplace privacy. So the, uh, you know, general um, advice is that prevention should be given more emphasis over detection. So if you're going to, uh, I mean, for, for an example, you want to prevent uh, your employees from accessing social media sites, during you know, working hours when they're in office, then um, so are you going to monitor all communications or are you going to just going to block access to those sites over uh, your uh, corporate network? So it's sometimes the uh, least intrusive method would be prevention as opposed to detection. And any monitoring or surveillance uh, mechanism must be designed proportionate to the structure, the scale and volume and sensitivity of the data concerned and the aims pursued. And it should also provide for legal safeguards such as notifications, uh, opting out in certain circumstances and you know, blocking certain access to URLs and so on. So it's important that you are upfront with the employee about the kind of monitoring that would take place. And in doing so, uh, I think it's, although it's not mandated in the act, it would be a good practice to uh, perform a data protection impact assessment, especially if you're going to engage in new technologies, uh, mechanisms to uh, monitor uh, the work of your employees. So when it comes to the rights of employees, you know, they are also part of the large uh, pool of data subjects, of course. So they also will be, uh, have uh, the right to exercise right to access right to objective processing if, if you are pursuing uh, legitimate interest, for example. And they would have the right to rectification, erasure, um, in, in, and those, of course, will be bound, I uh, mean, conditioned by the exemptions given in the act itself, such as um, there could be, uh, you may not be able to erase certain data because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, the retention is mandated by uh, tax authorities and so on. And automated decision making also plays a part here, especially I think you have heard examples of um, Amazon using this automated uh, recruiting software, which ended up being biased towards uh, female applicants. So when you're using things like uh, automated uh, decision making uh, mechanism, it's important that you adhere to the conditions given in the act as well. So withdrawal of consent uh, may not be uh, 
uh, relevant in most cases, especially if you're not going to rely on consent, because like I said earlier, consent is a uh, very fragile uh, basis to rely on. So, and you should also remember if you're going to allow consent to employees to process certain types of data, you must also give a corresponding right of withdrawal. So it will be, uh, I mean, you cannot just simply give the right to, uh, you know, give a uh, process personal database on consent and later, when an employee wants to withdraw that consent, it cannot be like, uh, no, we need to do that because the law requires us to do that, or we have a certain uh, you know, legitimate interest uh, we are pursuing, which we forgot to mention in the first place. So um, it's important to um, keep that in mind because uh, especially the, the, the uh, tricky part about giving, uh, you know, enabling consent is that you must also facilitate withdrawal of consent. So the key takeaways is that as an employer, uh, you uh, will also be considered as a controller within the meaning of the act. And you should, in devising your workplace monitoring policy, you must uh, look at uh, giving emphasis on prevention over detection. And it's important that you adhere to principles of transparency as much as possible so the employees are aware to the, the extent of its uh, uh, you know, uh, privacy and the extent of uh, the surveillance and monitoring. And any mechanism must be proportionate uh, to the aim pursued and follow strict data minimization practices. And as an employee, it's important that you respect for the privacy of employees as well. And by doing so, adopt the least intrusive method to achieve a particular outcome. I think with that brings me to the end of this session. And I'll be happy to answer your questions on chat because I think we are tight on time um, to start on the next session. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sandini, for sharing uh, the very informative uh, explanations on uh, personal data protection act and workplace privacy and uh, we have come to the final uh, session of today's workshop uh, which is privacy uh, by privacy by design as a means of achieving compliance under the personal data protection law regimes a uh, session will be delivered by Dr. Anne Kavakian, Executive Director, Global Privacy and Security by Design Center. Dr. Anne, I warmly welcome you for today's session on uh, data protection uh, workshop on the Personal Data Protection Act number nine of 2022. Uh, I may invite you to take over the session onwards. Dr. Ann, you're on mute. Sorry, um, I was gonna say, do you have my slides? If you can put my slides up and yes. then I'll ask you yes. to advance them. Will do. Can Perfect. you see the slides now? I can, thank you very much. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay. I always like to start by dispelling the myths associated with privacy because there are so many. In the next slide, please. One of the prevailing myths is that somehow privacy equals secrecy. So if you don't have anything to hide, what's the problem? You can just let everybody access your information. No, privacy is not about secrecy. It's all about control. In the next slide, it's all about personal control relating to the uses of your personal information. You should be the one to decide how to disclose the information, how you want it used, to whom you wish to have it disclosed. User control is critical. You have to have the freedom of choice relating to this because you see, context is key. Something may be sensitive to you, but it may not be sensitive to someone else. So someone else may wish to share it, but you don't. You have to be in control. The Germans have a wonderful term for this called informational self-determination. That is the individual who determines the fate of his or personal information. I love that, it really captures it, nails it. In the next slide, I also like to talk about why privacy is essential to freedom. 
It forms the foundation of our freedom. It's a necessary condition for societal prosperity and well-being. I was talking about all the innovation, the wild, crazy ideas, creativity, resultant prosperity of society. All of this requires freedom. You know, I think of Steve Jobs and the wild ideas he said had, and he used to say, I couldn't do all this, you know, in terms of Apple, if, if I couldn't just throw out crazy ideas and then get rid of half of them. Privacy is the essence of freedom because without privacy, individual human rights, property rights, civil liberties, these are the conceptual engines of innovation and creativity. None of this would exist in any kind of meaningful manner. Surveillance is the exact opposite. It's the antithesis of privacy. One of the negative consequences of surveillance is it usurps your limited cognitive bandwidth away from innovation and creativity. If you think someone is listening, it makes you go inward and all of a sudden creativity goes out the door. In the next slide, please. I created Privacy by Design many years ago uh, when I was first appointed Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, Canada. And you see, when I joined the commission, it was full of brilliant lawyers, of course, who applied the law beautifully. But you see, my background, I'm a psychologist. I study psychology and the law. I wanted a different approach. I wanted to prevent the privacy harms from arising. I wanted a model of proactive protection of data so that ideally you wouldn't have the data breaches and privacy infractions. And we had great success with this. It took me a while, I have to tell you, to convince the lawyers and the commission that this was worth including, not replacing the laws, of course not, but complementing it so that ideally it could reduce how much the law had to address. And as I said, we've had great luck with this. Next slide, please. In, I think it was 2010, Yes, so commissioners have a privacy and data protection conference once a year. It's usually in Europe. In 2010, it was in Jerusalem. And at the end of a three or four day session, we have a closed session where commissioners vote on various things. And I submitted um, privacy by design as something that I wanted people to vote on in terms of um, ensuring that privacy will be embedded into new technologies and business practices right from the outset proactively. And to my surprise, this was unanimously passed. And I was really surprised because as I said, most privacy commissioners are brilliant lawyers, lawyers. And I was amazed at this. So afterwards, I went around talking to everyone and I thanked them very much for voting in favor of this and I expressed my surprise. And they said, Anne, it shouldn't surprise you. Next slide, please. They said, right now, all we as commissioners are reaching with privacy laws is the tip of the iceberg. Most privacy breaches are remaining largely undetected and we're just getting a little bit at the top that's visible to us. They said the majority of the privacy breaches are remaining unregulated, unchallenged, unknown. And that, of course, was unacceptable to all of the commissioners. Regulatory compliance was no longer enough. And they said it's unsustainable as the sole model for ensuring the future of privacy. So they said, that's why we want to complement privacy laws with your creation of privacy by design. And I was just delighted to hear this, as you can imagine. And as I mentioned, we've had great luck with this. It's, been, it's now being followed in 165 countries all around the world. And the next slide, please. And it's been translated into 40 languages. Now, if you have a language that doesn't appear here <laughs> that you could translate privacy by design, uh, come and talk to me. I would love that because I would love for this to grow. And you know, it's so wonderful that most of the new privacy laws now are including privacy by design. So of course, the GDPR from 2018, uh, Brazil just passed a new law last year. The United States is considering a, a massive new federal law, and that includes privacy by design. So I'm very excited. Okay, in the next slide, the two essentials to privacy by design. You wanna prevent the privacy harms from arising, so you wanna be proactive. But the other one is we have to get rid of this zero sum model. What do I mean by that? Next slide, please. 
Zero sum means it's one or the other, either or, win, lose. It's privacy versus security or privacy versus data utility. And it's never privacy that wins over those other interests, nor should it be. But I sure as heck I'm not gonna have it lose out to all those other interests. It's ridiculous. It doesn't have to be that way. And the next slide, please. What we need to do is change the paradigm to positive sum model, which is and, privacy and security, privacy and data utility. It's as simple and as difficult as changing the paradigm from a zero sum to a positive sum to create a win-win scenario, not either or, involving unnecessary trade-offs and false dichotomies. It's as simple and as difficult as replacing the versus with and. But we can do this and we will get a much, much better outcome. Um, I, in Canada, uh, once a year, the Canadian Marketing Association invites me to give a keynote at their annual conference. And I always start by saying, <laughs> I'm sure I'm the least popular speaker here today. <laughs> and fortunately, they laugh. <laughs> And then they say, no, no, we know we have to learn about this stuff. And I said, privacy is not anti-marketing. It's pro-choice. You just have to hear the voice of the people. And in fact, it's much more effective for marketing if people will say, yes, they want to hear what you want to tell them and participate instead of forcing them into it. In the next slide, please. Um, uh, there are, just in case you might say, what is privacy by design? So it has seven foundational principles. I've been through most of it. I'm gonna go through this very quickly. You wanna prevent the harms from arising. Let me speak for a moment about privacy as the default setting, because this is huge. And this is also included in the GDPR, privacy as the default. What it means is you say your customers or your citizens, you don't have to ask for privacy. We don't expect you to wade through all the terms of service and all the legalese and the privacy policy to find the opt-out box that says, do not use my personal information for any purpose other than the purpose that I consented to, the primary purpose of the data collection. No, no, we don't expect you to do that. It takes way too long. What we do is we give you privacy automatically. It's the default setting. We will only use your personal information for the primary purpose of the data collection that you consented to. After that, if there's a secondary use that arises, we have to come back to you and seek your consent again. People love this. This builds trust like no other. It is just, people love it. Uh, companies that have gotten certified for privacy by design have come back and told me this builds trust like it's crazy, unbelievable. Okay, embedded in design speaks for itself. If you bake it into the code, it's always there. You can't forget about privacy. I've already talked to you about full functionality. I prefer positive sum always. Get rid of zero sum, either or, win, lose. And so yesterday, substitute win, win, plus positive sign. Now let me talk about security for a moment. While the term privacy subsumes a much broader set of protections than security alone, in this day and age of daily hacking and phishing, if you don't have a solid foundation of security from end to end with full lifecycle protection, you're not gonna have any privacy. So I assure you, you must start with a very solid foundation of security across the spectrum of all that you do. Visibility and transparency speaks for itself. Keep it open. I tell both companies and governments, you may have custody and control of someone's data. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the data subject. So give them a right of access to their data. And companies have come back to me, the ones that have gotten certified for privacy by design, and they told me they love this. Because what it does, they said, look, it increases the quality of the information we have. Because when people access their own information, they know when it's right or wrong. They come back to us and say, no, no, that piece of information, that was from two years ago. Here's the correct information from today. So it increases the accuracy of the information they have and raises the quality of all of it. It's a win-win. And again, keep it user-centric. If you have respect for user privacy right from the beginning, all of this will flow. And that's it. Those are my seven foundational principles of privacy by design. You might think, well, it sounds good, but it's too hard to do, right? Wrong. Take a look at this paper we published about 10 years ago. I was still commissioner. And 
It's all the companies we partnered with to show how you can do privacy by design in smart meters, in biometrics, surveillance cameras, RFIDs, NFCs, uh, remote home healthcare. We can do all of this. And that's what's so important for people to understand that all of this can be done with privacy by design. That's what people have to remember. It's not one or the other. And I'll give an example. Now, we work with Intel on remote home healthcare. A lot of uh, elderly people uh, want to stay living in their homes after their spouse may have passed away and they're now alone, but they still wanna live in their homes, but they may need some help from time to time. So Intel came up with this great system uh, where you could put um, wherever you wanted, this is all with the choice of the consent of the data subject living in the home, sensors throughout the house. For example, let's say you get up in the middle of the night to use the restroom, but you don't return within a said period of time, you might have fallen or something. The sensor on your bed will go off if you don't return within a predetermined period of time, and it will alert the people you want alerted. It's with your consent, all of this. No one else gets the information, but it will bring in help, much needed help to see what happened. And this is working beautifully. Again, as I said, it's all with your positive consent. You are in control. They love it. And there's lots of examples of this. So take a look at our paper. In the next slide, um, this is uh, near my end of the third term as privacy commissioner. I love being privacy commissioner. I'm the only one who served for three, three terms. <laughs> um, the Japanese Information Processing Development Center wrote me a letter and they said, privacy by design considered one of the most important concepts by members of the Japanese Information Processing Development Center. We've heard from Japan's private sector companies that we need to insist on the principle of positive sum, not zero sum, and become enlightened with privacy by design. And I thought, gosh, if the Japanese, whose first language is not English, if they understand the value of positive sum over zero sum, then surely the rest of us can follow this along and understand why it's so important. Next slide, please. So you might say, okay, maybe it's a good thing to do, but it's gonna to cost too much, right? Wrong. To do it proactively, of course, there's a cost involved to doing anything, but the cost involved to doing this proactively by design is a fraction of the cost you will incur if you don't do it, because then you will get a data breach, a privacy infraction. And these days, they're not just lawsuits that are incurred, they're class action lawsuits that cost millions of dollars. In the United States, especially, millions upon millions of dollars are lost through class action lawsuits. But the damage to your brand, to your reputation, may be irreparable, it may shut you down. And then the loss of consumer confidence and trust, there go your customers. You don't have a business left anymore. So get smart and get proactive. Spend a little bit upfront so you can avoid losing lots afterwards and you can attract new customers. Next slide, please. Of course, you all know about the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which came into effect in 2018. It strengthens and unifies data protection. For I, this says for individuals within the European Union, but really the effect of the GDPR has been global because countries all around the world want to upgrade their privacy laws so that they can meet the GDPR, so that they can engage in trade and commerce with Europe. But very important, it gives citizens control over their personal data. Remember what I said at the beginning, privacy is all about personal control. And it simplifies regulations across the EU by unifying them. So it's a real win-win. We've had just great success with this. In the next slide, please. And one of the things I was so excited about, of course, <laughs> was the, the language of privacy and data protection by design and privacy as the default now appears for the first time in a privacy statute. I mean, this is pretty amazing that it includes Privacy by design, data protection by design, privacy as the default, which I mentioned to you earlier, is the second of the seven foundational principles of privacy by design. 
And it's absolutely critical. It's a game changer. So I was thrilled, of course, as you could imagine, when this took place. Very, very exciting. In the next slide, please. Now, this was a little early. In 20, 2015, Information Age said that um, the EU likes privacy by design. It's referenced heavily in Article 25 and in many other places in the new regulation. And they said it's not too much of a stretch to say that if you implement privacy by design, you've mastered the GDPR. <laughs> I assure you, there is much more to privacy by design, I'm sorry, much more to the GDPR than privacy by design. And that's why I wanna focus on this. Article 25 is where the primary place where privacy by design appear. But I think the sentiment reflected here is that if you do privacy by design, all of it, you will automatically end up fulfilling a number of the other requirements of the GDPR so that it really will work in your favor in a very broad sense. Okay, I mentioned in the next slide, please, I mentioned to you that I'm offering privacy by design certification now with KPMG. Um, it's working beautifully. And the way it works is co companies come to me and they say, we wanna be certified for privacy by design. And with their consent, I say, I'll refer KPMG to you and they will come and look under the hood, so to speak. They will examine all of your processes and make sure that you are in fact following the letter of privacy by design. And then they will give me a report. And when I get the report, if I agree, which I usually do because KPMG is stringent, they do an excellent job on this, then I issue certification for privacy by design. And it's just been great because companies have told me, so I tell companies, if you are certified, put it on your website, sing it from the rooftops, tell everyone you've been certified for privacy by design because by doing so, it gives you so much value. The trust that, this is what companies are telling me after they get certified. They say it has enhanced trust dramatically. They said, we cannot tell you how much people trust us now. It's like, we used to tell them the same thing before, but they didn't believe us. Now, because we have independent certification and your name is associated with it. They trust us. We're keeping the customers we have. It's attracting new opportunity, new customers. We love it. So we've had great success with um, PBD as certification with KPMG. And if you're interested, I also teach a course at Ryerson University here in Canada on privacy by design, because sometimes people like taking a course on these things. And I'm a university professor, so I love teaching this stuff. And it's just to walk you through all the specifics. It really gets you going and it gets people excited. So it makes me very pleased that um, there have been so many people taking this course. I keep offering it again and again because there is so much interest. So if any of you have an interest, it's an online course, so you can take it from wherever you may live. Let me end, ladies and gentlemen, by just reviewing that privacy and security risks are best managed proactively, always, by embedding the principles of privacy by design. You always want to prevent the harm from arising upfront proactively. Avoid the data breach. Avoid the cost involved. It's much better. When you focus on prevention, it's also much easier and far more cost effective to build in both privacy and security upfront rather than after the fact. It reflects the most ethical treatment of personal data imaginable. And people love it because it reflects this ethical approach. I'm gonna mention it again, get rid of zero sum thinking that was so yesterday, either or, forget it. Embrace doubly enabling systems, privacy and security privacy and data utility. And as I mentioned, privacy and marketing. Yes, you can do both. <laughs> so a colleague of mine, Kai Rannenberg, he always used to say to me, if people are smart, they'll lead with privacy by design. But if not, they're gonna get privacy by chance or far worse privacy by disaster because the regulator will come knocking on the door. So let's get smart and do it proactively. It'll be fun, much, much easier. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And the next slide, this is how you can contact me. Um, I don't know if any of you follow Twitter, but every morning, uh, five to six in the morning, I tweet out the latest stories of the day. My husband is a saint, <laughs> but I just like to get the information out there. So you can just take a look at it. And this is also my, my website. If you have any interest, please take a look at it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Anne, for joining with us today for, for this session. And thank you so much again for sharing the uh, very uh, good insights on the concept of pri privacy by design as a tool for compliance under the personal data protection law. So, um, with that, uh, I will have a quick recap of the today's session that uh, we hope that you got the insights, understanding of following uh, the powers and the function of the Data Protection Authority, cross border data processing under the uh, PDPA and uh, control specific obligations under the PDPA, processor specific obligations under the Act and the importance of inf information security standards and practices uh, under, uh, under the Personal Data Protection Act and the concept of privacy by design as a tool for compliance under the personal data protection laws. With that, we have come to the conclusion of the today's session. I may now welcome Mr. Shiran Fernando, the Chief Economist of the Salon Chamber of Commerce to do the conclusion uh, of the session today. Shiran, over to you. Thanks, yeah, thanks Shiran. I'm just wondering, um, Sandhani, if you had any questions for Dr. Ann? Um, Happy to take questions if you have any. Yeah, I think, uh, do we have time? Sure. We have a few minutes, so. Okay, yes, great. we do have. Um, so again, thank you, Dr. Anne, for joining us all the way from Toronto. And sure. we we have a few questions, um, actually, uh, because, I mean, of course, the GDPR does specify privacy by design and uh, uh, pri privacy by default, but uh, under the Personal Data Protection Act in uh, Sri Lanka does not explicitly contain those terms. So in such context, why would a controller or processor feel compelled or, you know, be inspired to follow these principles at all? My answer would be, and I will speak to you um, as a, a former controller, that if you do privacy by design in whatever form, you, know, you don't have to call it that, but if you take proactive measures to protect the personal data that you hold, you'll be far more effective in protecting that data, which is your job. You should be protecting the personal data that you have in your possession. It's given to you for a particular purpose, not to do whatever you want with it. It's for a very particular purpose and it should fulfill that purpose. But your obligation is to protect that data. So I would suggest that doing it proactively, you don't have to call it privacy by design, but doing it proactively is a far more successful method of protecting the data. Okay, that was nicely put, uh, Dr. Ann. So uh, just adding on to that, like uh, what are the possible challenges would a, do you think a controller may face when operationalizing this principle of privacy by design? And what, are your, what is your advice uh, to them? I mean, these, I mean, in Sri Lanka, these are organizations who are just starting off on their compliance journey. So to them, what would be your one advice? To them, my advice would be, you want to prevent as many privacy harms as possible. You don't wanna to have to investigate complaint after complaint about what the controllers have done with their information, et cetera. You wanna minimize that. So the way you minimize it is by ensuring that the privacy protect, protections are upfront embedded into the code, into the design of your operations so that it's not an afterthought. You want it to be thought of beforehand, not afterwards. And it will work to your advantage because it will reduce the amount of investigation you need to do when all the complaints arise when it's afterwards. And um, there's one more question just uh, before we wrap up. Um, so in what way can uh, adhering to privacy by design principles uh, boost consumer trust and spur innovation uh, in, a, in a controller's uh, business? 
Oh, trust is boosted dramatically when you do privacy by design. So many governments and companies have told me this. So if you follow privacy by design, your organization should, as I say, shout it from the rooftops. Tell everyone the lengths you're going to to protect their data proactively, ideally to prevent the privacy harms from arising. You spread the word on this and you tell them how much you respect their privacy and that's why you're going to such lengths to protect their data. They will love you for it and you will gain incredibly. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Um, thank you, Dr. Anne. I think that's the questions uh, from my end. Um, over to you, Shudan. Thanks, something I, I don't know if you saw that one last question on data protection management program. I haven't seen anything. Sorry, I think I missed it. Okay, so question is data protection management. Would the data protection management program address the concept of privacy by design? So the data protection management program is something that is mandated in the uh, Sri Lankan Data Protection Act uh, on, under the principle of accountability. And uh, so it basically talks about uh, formulating your internal mechanics, governance structure, the governance internal oversight mechanisms uh, to meet the obligations under the act. So um, I think what you could do is weave it into that. Obviously, it doesn't spell out privacy by design, but it's, it's implied. So I would weave it in to enhance accountability and protection of the data in the best possible way and making it a win-win. You can do this. And I think, I think your citizens and customers will be very grateful to you for doing that. Thank you, Dr. Anne. I think that's all we have uh, in the chat. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anne, and thank you, uh, Santani. So uh, I think uh, we're right on time in terms of schedule, and then thank you to all the speakers as well. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, Janta Fernando, we had uh, Sandini, uh, who had multiple presentations and, and moderations as well, uh, leading this uh, workshop and by the, through the design of it as well as in the delivery. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, efforts on it. Uh, we had Shanuka uh, from Dialog joining in, uh, part of the uh, 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 drafting committee uh, as well, and uh, Sujit Christie as well. Thank you so much for uh, your session just after the break. And of course, Dr. Anne, I think that was a great session to wrap up uh, the workshop and, and ending on a good note as well. Uh, thank thank you. you to all the participants. I think we had over 300 at, at the beginning, uh, and, and I'm sure a lot of you would have asked for the recording and some of the material. We will uh, be hosting it on our Chamber Academy YouTube page, and we'll share the link and all the material as well. Uh, we'd appreciate if you can give feedback, uh, maybe if you'd like, uh, since we're, as, as uh, Aliki mentioned at the start, we're looking to do a series uh, more sector-wise as well. This was the first general overview of it. And if uh, you would like your sector to be considered or some feedback as to some information you'd, you'd really like, uh, we're hoping to do very curated sessions uh, um, in the next few uh, months uh, for each of these sectors. So that'll be uh, useful feedback for us to hear as well. Um, and um, I think a lot of the output from this session also we'll be, be hoping to carry out in terms of articles and, and um, uh, visibility to kind of provide these insights to a wider audience beyond those of you who attended this as well. Uh, so thank you to everyone uh, who, who joined in and uh, participated. Uh, and for the interactive Q&A that we had on the chat box as well. Um, and, and look forward to uh, meeting you in, in a future workshop and, and webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, Shiran. Thank you.